It's time for Mac Break Weekly. Andy and Renee are here. Alex has the day off, but Renee's back from his Apple briefings. Lots to talk about with iOS 15, spatial audio. Uh, we've got those new Beats pods in house. There's a whole lot more coming up. Andy, Renee, and me. Mac Break Weekly is next. Podcasts you love from people you trust. This is Twit. This is Mac Break Weekly, episode 770, recorded Tuesday, June 15th, 2021. Poseidon's Laptop. Mac Break Weekly is brought to you by Audible. For a limited time, Amazon Prime members can save 53% on four months of Audible. That's only $6.95 a month. Take advantage of this incredible limited time offer at audible.com slash MacBreak. And if you're listening after this limited time offer has expired and you're a new member, try Audible Plus for 30 days with a free trial at audible.com slash MacBreak. You can also text MacBreak to 500-500. And by Udacity. Gain in-demand tech skills in as little as three months with Udacity's part-time online tech courses. Visit udacity.com slash twit and get 75% off any program with the code TWIT75. Offer ends June 30th, 2021. And by AT&T Active Armor. We rely so much on our phones these days and are always on them, whether it's live streaming content, catching up with family on weekly video calls, or watching your favorite podcast. There's no room for fraud calls. Thankfully, AT&T makes customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. AT&T Active Armor. 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats at no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. Visit att.com slash active armor for details. It's time for Mac Break Weekly, the show we cover the latest news from Apple. And we are kind of in the, in the moment, you know, after all the excitement, you take a deep breath. <sighs> and now you kind of reflect. Smoke a cigarette. Have a cigarette. <laughs> Renee Ritchie Not in really. the post climactic mode. Hello, Renee. Hello, Leo. It's so good to be back. We missed you. We missed you. But uh, you I were did. busy getting uh, all the details, which you are now going to share with us. Yes, absolutely. About all the stuff Apple announced. Uh, Renee was also on This Week in Tech on Sunday. It was really good to have you. Turned out to be a more Mac ish panel than I thought. Jason Snell, you. <laughs> And then I, I, I thought, yes. well, we'll have Philip Michaels from Tom's Guide because, you know, he could talk about other stuff. Turns out he was a Mac guy, too. So <laughs> it was all Mac. Mac world spread everywhere. It was okay. I had people in the chat room going, if this is going to be all Mac, I'm going to go have a sandwich. <laughs> 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 we got to other things. Don't worry. Andy Nako is also here. WGBH in Boston. Hello, Andrew. Hello. I, I I thought of it more like uh, like the when the when the circus has been in town and like you had a great time for the past couple of days and now you're just watching them strike the tents. Yeah. And you're like, oh, the elephants are going back to the rail yard. Yeah. Well, ho 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 hopefully better, better imagery than that. But, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not this. Not the knackers. Not the knackers yard. The rail yard. They get back on the train, and they go to another town. The, the carnies have all like hit the pawn shops. Yeah, the, the deposit, all the jewelry, jewelry and stuff that they flipped in the cars. The soldiers. Yeah, yeah the that's a, now we're getting now it is a little, Times little grim. <laughs> get that uh, get that Colt Malt Forty liquor and take the tents down, everybody. <laughs> um, but I think it uh, so. MacWorld, I'm sorry, WWDC is over for another year. Uh, I think it was a good uh, dub dub. Uh, I'm seeing some people saying, oh. Uh, I think some of it because everybody wanted to see a, a MacBook with yeah, uh, a new chip. Expectational debt. And we talked about this on Sunday, but actually Apple uh, kind of, uh, oops, <laughs> a little oops. <laughs> Somebody in the basement, the guy who was responsible for creating the tags for the YouTube video for the WWDC keynote, didn't get the memo. Excuse me, I'm down here in your basement. And, I, <laughs> and he's adding the tags and uh, added... Advertently or inadvertently, we, it's unclear. Some interesting tags: M1X, a, an unannounced processor, presumably the successor of the M1, and even more intriguingly, MacBook Pro M1X. So, Renee, hmm. is that a mistake, hmm. or is that intentional, or is it meaningless? 
Uh, I mean, for all intents and purposes for us, because we didn't get it, it's meaningless. But it, it is a curiosity. And you never know if it is somebody who's like just sitting there with his optimization tools, getting suggested keywords based on other videos that have WWDC in them. And he's just like, oh, add all of these, not realizing that SEO on YouTube is completely different than it is on Google. And nobody nobody cares about your Darren Targs anymore. They just don't have really any effect on a video. But that, that's sort of one of those below the radar um, screw ups. It could go either way. Uh, I other people are saying the event was 15 minutes shorter than it was last year. So maybe, uh, you know, someone. Yeah. I mean, if you're planning to delete, two, certainly if you pre-record these, you can use the full two hours to the, to the second. Uh, and there, it was only an hour 45. There's also, you know, I wish Alex were here because last time on the last Apple event, he was the one who said there's two jump cuts. That's where they snipped out the content. I didn't notice any jump cuts, but I wasn't looking for them. Alex would have seen them. Um, this is, by the way, it's not something I could see how you might put it in and forget it because it's not something you see at the bottom of the video or anything. It's literally in the HTML code as a meta tag. Yeah, so it's clearly, it's clearly not part of the, uh, the brief like checklist. Yeah. But somebody typed it in and, right, no, obviously. Yeah, and yeah. it's not obvious anymore. Right. Like you, like YouTube doesn't surface that anymore. They hide that. Right. Uh, you have to go press a button and then it says these tags are really only meant for common misspellings of words. And you got to decide, okay, I'm going to fill a bunch of them in anyway. Oh, that's or interesting. Your, your SEO tool do it for you. Oh, that's interesting. Which is my guess is like SEO tools are just still stuck on this stuff. M1X makes sense. Uh, that's what Apple did with the iPad uh, and iPhone processors. The uh, I, iPads traditionally had A14X, for instance, right? Yeah, uh, uh, A12X, A10X, A12X, yeah. yeah. So that would be next generation. Uh, well, so it wouldn't be next generation. Um, the, the numbers are the generation. It's oh. just the way that Apple measures silicon IP. So like A14 is this current generation. M1 is an A14 generation chip. The next generation will be M2, which is the same as the M1, ultra low power, meant for MacBooks and entry-level um, uh, Mac minis and and i and uh, iPad Pro, sorry MacBook Pros. Um, the X means it's extended, so it has extra capabilities, extra cores, uh, extra IP. Like sometimes it has extra memory bandwidth. So it's like the supersized version of the current chip. Oh, that's interesting. But same generation in terms of IP. So that's something that might disappoint some people. Uh, you know, if they want a 16-inch MacBook Pro with the Apple Silicon, they might want an M. Two, but maybe that's next year. You, it, will it be yearly? A fifteen comes out. Yeah, It'll be like September. The earliest it could be is September when the A fifteen generation of of, our, of chipsets are ready. Because really, an M one X is an A fourteen X, basically. And Apple hasn't done the X versions every year. Like they started doing them with like gangbusters, but then when we got to like the A ten, they didn't do an A eleven. They didn't do an A thirteen X. They started skipping. Uh, generation. Just so to, will they do an M2? Like, yeah, it, it'll be to, interesting to just see. Just to throw M2 sand in our eyes. <laughs> <laughs> well, they didn't, like their product update schedule wasn't as fast. They only, they made new iPhones every year, but they only made new iPad Pros every 18 months, basically for several years. According to Mr. German, uh, this chip will have up to 32 GPU cores. That is a question. I asked this on Sunday because my uh, nephew, Will, graduated from the Rhode Island School of Design uh, this month, and I was going to give him a new MacBook. He needs it for work, and uh, which surprised me. I said, no, they'll give you one. He said, no, they don't. <laughs> I said, Wait, you get your, a new job and they expect you to bring your own laptop? He said, yeah. So I, uh, and, and his, wow. his, his, I know, his potential boss said, oh, make sure you get the Radeon, whatever it is, 5800M, the top of the line Intel MacBook Pro. And uh, and I said, well, I, based on what I'm seeing with, for instance, Adobe, which has said, kind of misleadingly, our, our apps are twice as fast in the M1 compared to the i5. Um, I presume that a next generation Apple chip would have, would it have 5,800 capable uh, quality uh, graphics? I presume it would. I don't think you need, I don't think you need next generation. I don't think it's a, it's a product. Like, so even the then M1X would have the same cores. Like each core would be the same. The performance cores would be the same. The graphics cores would be the same. They would just have more of them, especially more performance cores and more GPU cores. Maybe because if there's different cooling systems, maybe they could tune the frequencies slightly faster, but they, they're reticent to touch battery life on a lot of these devices. So the, the frequencies, they would just have more of them. And that's what's the case with the M1 right now is they're all the same frequency, right? Yes. So they just cool or don't cool, and then right. they ramp down or don't ramp down. Right. Very little difference, really, between all the M1s currently. Yeah. 
In fact, I was going to buy, I thought, oh, I give up <laughs> after this. <laughs> and I was going to, I'm just going to buy a Mac mini so I can use it on my desktop. And then I thought, wait a minute, just get a dock because your M1 MacBook Pro is as good as the Mac mini. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I did. Anything I Anything over 30 minutes, top. you'll notice no difference. Yeah. Like it, at 30 minutes, the M, the Mac mini will keep going because like it'll keep peak frequency because it's cooling. It's just, it's not much more voluminous and that much better cooling. Right. And, but after like, like, are you doing anything that's going to take peak load for 30 minutes? Uh, it is possible. I guess they could put, two, you know, Bloomberg saying that besides 32 GPUs, they will have um, more RAM and they might even put in yeah. two chips or dual core, in other words. So that would be another way that you could beef this up without getting a new generation chip in there. Mm. It would also, also be a way you could add more though. Thunderbolt, Thunderbird, Thunderbird, yeah. Thunderbolt ports. <laughs> <laughs> That big flame decal on the, on the lid of the MacBook. <laughs> you know, they did kind of miss a bet, didn't they? Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, chips also, they, they, this is a report from somewhere, I don't know, uh, um, I guess German, but um, Apple Ready's MacBook Pro. This is back in May, though. That's the problem. The MacBook yeah. Air revamps. So I don't know. This may all be, it's pretty clear that they must have been. Making it, although supply chain rumors now say they're going to start making it in a month or two. Yeah. Maybe he's, because... He did a bunch of reports that he's pushed back in time. And it's yeah. hard to tell up because like when, when anybody writes about something, they're writing about the echoes of decisions Apple made months ago. That, and it's hard to tell what's imminent. But like he, he did a watch report yesterday on the same stuff he reported on three months ago, but said it's next year instead of this year. Yeah. And this is the same sort of... like The, the next MacBook Air is going to be a redesign with M2, but... When does that come out? The end of this year, beginning of next year? That stuff's all malleable. Apple's current M1 Macs use an Intel component, the USB retimer. That could be one of the many little chips that are in short supply that could be holding this up, too. I would. Do you think it's a chip shortage that's really the issue? Because I know they have the all the M1s. Trailing they edge can, node, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, trailing edge node stuff. That's like, not, not like forget five nanometer. That's like 90 nanometer right. stuff. That's all the old, you know, battleship chips that they put in to do every other thing that Apple's not doing. And those are in, in hard supply. Yeah, what, one of the one of the problems there is that that's uh, the 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 workhorse chips that use the old fashioned uh, fab technology. It's not very those machines aren't very profitable. So when chip fabs get an opportunity to make more use of their factory floor space, they tend to like shunt that stuff out and sell those that machinery off to other makers. And so rather instead of this instead of the technology for manufacturing that stuff becoming more accessible and more prevalent, it, that doesn't necessarily scale uh, year to year to year because again you're you're now you're making now you're making chips for microwave ovens now you're making uh, chips for for uh, for back ends of TVs so yeah the the chip shortage affects a, a much much broader pipeline than you think so there's there's the with a heavy heart portion of the show <laughs> yeah. Yeah. no new hardware were so mad but, though at Leo they were so angry who Oh, that we didn't get at the Mac. Like there were some people who watched WWC and they felt like they had been promised new MacBook Pros. Yeah, and they also no, felt they like haven't. because Apple put an M1 chip in the iPad, they were being promised Mac OS on the iPad, and Apple broke that promise to yeah. them. And so there were those two those two harpoons of anger just coursing through a very small percentage of nerd souls all weekend. Small percentage, because every reasonable person knows. In fact, German has now started putting it in as a disclaimer in a lot of his articles that the timeline may vary. You know, yeah. that you can, you can, just as you say, you can tell people what Apple's working on, but there's no way of knowing what Apple's release You're not in charge of shipping is. it. Yeah. Yeah. This is why at least until the, until the end of the year, if there's a piece of technology that you're considering buying and the seller gives you like a really generous return policy like Apple does, just pre-order it. <laughs> pre just pre-order it to get your first order, get that part of that first shipment in. And if you don't like it, return it. Or if you decide that, okay, this isn't really the right time, return it. Because it's possible that if you need something in November or December, you're just not going to be able to get your hands on it, even if it's been out for three or four months. Okay. 
So calm down. There's also down. this weird phenomena with like, I, I don't want to just say like nerds in general, but there are some people who they are desperately angry that Apple doesn't put out something when they're ready to buy. And then the moment right. they buy it, if Apple announces a new version, they get even angrier. <laughs> like they want stuff to only be available when they want to buy it. And they don't want Apple to ever put out anything new because that invalidates what they bought. And like the advice I keep giving is just wait as long as you possibly can before you buy. Buy when you absolutely need to buy. Get the best thing you can buy and then just enjoy the stuffing out of it because there will always be something next. So you can't right. you can't do this mental warfare on yourself. Yeah. Also, also try, try to do the math on what your how much your how much I benefited from having this M1 uh, M1 MacBook for the past what now seven eight nine months versus what I would have had to what I would have had to put up with if I had to, if I had to now wait a year uh, for a MacBook Pro. I mean I I would have bet money on Apple at least announcing a a new evolutions uh, new evolutions of M1 based MacBooks. Uh, excuse me, Apple Silicon based Mac. Macintoshes at WWDC, I was absolutely prepared to be, oh gosh, I could have had an SD card slot uh, on my MacBook if I had waited until Same. June. But that, but then you you would have waited and now you're going to be, you would have been waiting another, like, what now three, probably, I, I'm, I'm, that's probably maybe a, a topic for a later part in the show, but at some point, at least a couple of months later, Apple's going to announce this thing and they're probably going to ship it even later than that. Yeah. That's, you know, so good. Everybody relax. It's fine. You're going to get great stuff. Um, there's three really nice M1s out there right now. They're a good choice. Um, Leo knows whenever he buys a new version comes out. <laughs> something new is going to come out. That's just inevitable. Yeah. Uh, and, and I guess fall, right, at this point, uh, before anything, any new hardware. I mean, traditionally it's October. Like yeah. traditionally October is the big Mac event. September's like, who phones. Knows? October in these years, yeah, but like yeah. they were, they they did some they did phones in October and Max in November last year because the world is you know upside down right now. It's unpredictable because, because of shortage. These little events, chip shortages are yeah, real. But they can and also do it anytime. Yeah, like they could decide like yeah. it's July and we want to make another episode of the Apple event series. The only compelling argument for that is people do make laptop purchases or at least plan for laptop purchases for fall semesters for students right about now. You don't want to wait too long for Although that. The M1's probably fine for that. Like these are the more pro beefy expensive it machines. Is. You know? Yeah. Yeah. It's also not using it's also using the old uh, display panel technology. So there're fewer problems with getting your hold of everything you need to build that thing. Yeah. Actually, I think the MacBook Air is pretty much the perfect computer. Just buy I don't it. think you're wrong. Yeah. It's just buy it. I mean, yeah. for, for for a Mac, you're you're getting a you're getting a lot of stuff for not a whole lot of money. Uh, you and you'll you you're, you're going to have a hard time convincing someone who spent that much or a little bit more on a, on an iPad Pro that you know that uh, that you're unhappy with this uh, <laughs> bottom bottom of the list Mac purchase that nonetheless a very very beefy processor does everything you want to do you attach one thunderbolt cable to your desktop and suddenly you've got hard drives you've got <laughs> you've got hard drives you got a screen uh, and they actually they actually all work natively uh, like the way that you expect a computer to work as opposed to the same thing when you plug the same thing into a into an iPad Pro i still love mine but yeah that's that's a thing yeah i got a thunder i got a um uh, anchor 250 dollar thunderbolt 3 dock um and I just put it next because they have this giant monitor. I thought, well, it'd be kind of nice if I could use. Yep. That's why I was get the mini. And yeah, you just dock the MacBook Pro. It's pretty functionally very almost identical to the mini. I've got, I've got my, I've got this right now. The my Mac, my M1 MacBook is the most most powerful Mac I've got in the house. And so right now it's it's plugged into a two hundred fifty dollar Cal Digit dock. Again, hard drives. I'm ripping movies. I'm doing everything that I need to do. Uh, and actually, I have to remind myself to undock it so I can exercise the battery once a month or so because it's just my. It's just my my uh, my M1 uh, Mac Mini right now. I wonder if I overbought. Don't complain. Do you think I overbought? Because uh, I spent 250 bucks on this anchor, but it's a Thunderbolt three, and it has of course a ton of ports. Um, yeah, it's nice. I mean, I I feel like this way I could basically make the MacBook be a desktop with just yep. this addition yep. of this little thing. And mine started yelling at me the other day. Like last week, it started saying, you haven't been taking this Mac off power. So we're only going to charge it to 60%. Yeah, that's because you're obviously thing. not moving it around. Yeah, that's the new thing. Yeah. I think that's smart. But I actually. had to unplug it for a while to get it to, yeah. yeah. You never take me anywhere. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but like, look at the world. I mean, like read the room MacBook Pro. This thing has a Ethernet port, uh, gigabit Ethernet port, which I which is good. So when I dock, I'm now on hardwired. It's got HDMI. So it's just, it's connected to my monitor. I do have to, 
do, you know, do some shenanigans with the monitor to switch it over to a different port, but that's all. Uh, yeah. And I, and I have a mouse and keyboard and it's nice. It's, it works and it's very a, well. And, you have and, and it's a, that's a perfectly in, uh, device independent standard. So if your needs change, you'll be able to use well, this on other devices the next couple of years. This morning, somebody said, oh yeah, we're going to review a uh, Thunderbolt dock for the, uh, the uh, iPad Pro. And I thought, oh, so I connected the new M1 oh, yeah. iPad Pro to it, and it works too. It doesn't yeah, go yeah. full screen because it's a four by three. Right. So it uh, the aspect ratio is wrong. But it looks pretty nice. <laughs> it works. And the keyboard yeah. and the mouse, I, I you had an Apple Magic uh, mouse and a, uh, the, one of the Matthias keyboards paired up just fine. It's kind of wild. It does, it does, but it does give you uh, like a big. Uh, that was, I did that like my very first day because, of course, I've got this. I got the Thunderbolt dock, so I, you got to try it. Um, and it, it, a lot of it is like the agony and the ex ecstasy because you're like, oh my god, I can't believe this. It really is like a desktop, and and the and it actually works nice as a as a mouse based or trackpad based interface. I'm very very happy with it. I could use it that way. So, oh wow, yes, and look, my 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 hard drives again. I've got like three different volumes like mounted on the mount on the desktop here in my MacBook, like, hey, wow, they're all showing up to the iPad. And that's when, like, the agony part comes, like, oh, that's right. I have to deal with the files app and I yeah. can copy files, but it's not going it, to, it's not going to, there's no eject, there is no eject button, like, safe eject button in the interface. So I'm just going to have to, like, <laughs> I'm going to have to, like, go through all this stuff to make sure that this, like, eight terabyte hard drive is not going to get smoked uh, with its directories or anything like that. That is, like, you see where all the complaints are coming from where, my God, this is great, great hardware, but if you could just put like one more intern on this project of the files app, I know you got two <laughs> interns working on it and you gave them like half the whole summer to work on it. I'm sorry, I'm being, I'm being, I'm sorry, I realized I was being like a jerk. I'm, I'm, I'm just saying that it, you're, the files app has a lot of potential that was, we were excited about when it first came out, but at this point I should have essentially a version of the finder that's appropriate for the iPad. And I don't have anything close to that yes. right now. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to stick with the MacBook, not the iPad. The iPad's really an iPad. It's, 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 it's a nice, iPad. it's a nice ad. It's a nice value add, yes. but it doesn't exploit the, the, the potential. If it weren't for, if it weren't for the way that the iPad handles files, I think that it would at least be the, the discussion of, well, if you've got less than a thousand dollars to spend on an Apple branded desktop, Maybe you could even consider getting uh, one of the, the smaller iPad Pro with Thunderbolt and even dock it to your desktop. For a lot, for a lot of people, this would be a, a perfectly adequate solution. But without the ability to simply, hey, I've got something on a flash drive that someone gave me, or I'm some, a file that I've downloaded from someplace, I need to move it from here to here. That's not a really good option. It'd be really not in, your sole computer. It, when see one of the things I'm really interested in is the. Uh, uh, it used to be called Sidecar. This is coming in iOS 15. The ability. Yes. Yeah. Then it kind of might make sense because you can drag a file from your desktop to your iPad. Universal or, control. Yeah, I really like right. that. I think that's, that's, if it works, that's going to be unbelievable. That, that's super. The, the That does presume that you have more than one computer. Um, which is uh, which again? I think most the most appropriate use of an iPad is as an accessory, as yeah. your super mobile right. uh, alternative to something else you have. But that's not what uh, Apple's ads show. You've seen the new Apple yeah, ads, right? Yeah, exactly. Well, you can and, AirPlay and again, the Mac as well now, though. So you have both sides. Yeah, but it's it's like it's it's disappointing because those of us who really really are not only like maybe not not just early adopters of the iPad, but early believers, the people who are like even like at the first demo. We were like, oh, there's so much you could do with this concept. This could, this could be, this is like the sports car where if I just take all of this unnecessary weight off of this, then this could be so much faster and so much efficient at this job that it's being designed to do. And this is, this is where it kind of drops the ball. It could really be. Apple's version of a six hundred dollar uh, Windows uh, Windows multi touch notebook. If it had, if you, if they could just sand over some of these sharp splinters that you get whenever you rub the, your hands over it in a way that Apple did not think that you were going to rub your hand over it. I felt really belittled a little bit by Apple's new ads. iPad, your next computer is not a computer because honestly, yeah. I feel just like these people. There she is in her desk Look with at this stuff. <laughs> the Isn't printer, the cables, Wouldn't you think my collection's complete? <laughs> the wires. And she looks out the window and there's somebody doing everything she ever wanted to do on an iPad. That's me, actually, right there. 
Massachusetts and what's in school. <laughs> you want the thingamabobs? You ever want, I got plenty. Ever need. But who Which is ironic because Apple is the dongle company that they're mocking right. a guy's dongles, but okay. See, in a way, Apple's cannibalizing their own audience with this, aren't they? Always. That's the idea. You always said that, Renee. Yeah. yeah. Of course, of course, it's ironic that they're choosing the Little Mermaid, a, 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 a girl who leapt into like an initially attractive situation without thinking things through and wound herself <laughs> almost royally screwed. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> when, she, when she should have just bought a laptop like her dad, the king, told her to get. I think they're still tweeting us, Andy. <laughs> the the, the like, king of textual like, uh, textual analysis, Mr. Andrew Anako. I'm well, giving I am you a, a, I am a communications professional. <laughs> My issue is that like even the finder is not good enough and like i'm hoping that this yeah. files finally has a little thing that spins around to tell me you know the pro it has a progress circle finally right but like I, every day every day i try to copy 100 to 200 gigabyte files between my cfast or my, C, my C, uh, cf express card and my mac and finally just goes you can't disconnect this and I'm, I'm not disconnecting it nothing in space time has moved and then like the right. file slows down and then it reconnects <laughs> and it just I don't. I don't want to see that anymore. Like, if that's not helpful to me, because all you're doing is ruining my transaction. I need a new system where you're peacefully in the background, using all the great things about Apple File System, buffering it redundantly, so that if there's any dis like connections, reconnections, I don't need to see that. You just handle that like packet loss on the internet. We have these wonderful technologies now. I demand better than both Finder and the Files app. <laughs> so you tired know, of them. Just to make you feel better, the situation's no better in Windows. It, I don't know why it is, but these explore apps that are really kind of fundamental to an operating system that let you see what's on your hard drive, they're terrible. They're so inconsiderate. It, and uh, by the way, on Linux too, I'm thinking about the Gnome's uh, Nautilus uh, finder is just as bad. So maybe there's something about these kinds of utilities that <laughs> they're just, they're not well done. Yeah. I know what it is. Yeah. That's the job you give to Joe. It's like, oh, who wants to code the Explorer? I'll <laughs> let Joe do it. He just got out of college. He'll have fun with it. It's not the it's not the job that the top of the line programmers want. Maybe yeah. that's my you don't, theory. You don't you don't you don't hire someone who uh, who is top in their class at Stanford uh, and hire them away from uh, from another prestigious career by saying we're going to put you in charge of making it make <laughs> sense how you move files from one device to another. Uh, it's like, well, I've got to. Be so angry at us in a Do minute. I have to? <laughs> my PhD work was about this new type of eye drop that gives you AR just through this liquid coating over the sclera of your eye. The manager Doc can find write eye stupid works in Ireland. <laughs> Manager can write stupid logging what we code that's, himself. That's a great idea. What we really need is an eject button <laughs> on the here, files app monkey. in the iPad. <laughs> that's uh, a twenty percent project. Yeah, <laughs> we will. We will see some interesting changes, however, in iOS 15. I'm very I, excited about. I'm certain. All of that. I'm certain the big things are happening in the next year in iPad OS. But this this would have been a great year for them to like make the great things happen, or at least show off thing great things they hope to happen in 2022. On iOS Maybe 15, multitasking is good though. Like there are some. There are some good things on the iPad this year. Oh, just, I'm excited. Uh, better, no, but they're not there yet. Yeah. Oh, you mean like even with iOS 14? iPad OS 14? No, well, iPad OS 15. Like, yes. like just the, the way they. Like, oh, everything's going to get better. The, yes. Multitasking was like arcane, like arcane spellcraft. I you, never used it. You had to figure out right. just the exact I don't understand touch it. to not pull an app off the dock or to delete it by accident or to launch it, but to pull it into the window you wanted. Um, and God help you if you wanted to put it into slide over immediately or yeah. change a setup you already had. And they fixed so much of that. Absolutely. But, but, I can't, but isn't, I, isn't it? I'm re almost, sorry. I'm so close to doing the public beta on iPad OS 15. I'm doing the beta. It's good. Yeah. I'll wait till it, you say it, it's okay. Isn't it bizarre that all that all that was uh, for me at least twenty percent of that is just by oh wow you actually gave me keyboard shortcuts for managing multitasking operations yes it's like wow nineteen eighty eight rocks <laughs> and more than that like for everything like they gave keyboard like it's fully bounced almost everything now it's like they they did the promise of that two years ago saying every every feature should be accessible to everybody no matter what the input method is trackpad keyboard voice uh, you know touch all of those should be coequal uh, but it it's taken a while. Yeah. <laughs> Public beta is out for iOS 14.7, watch OS 7.6, Mac OS 11.5, but not for Monterey. There is a, when is the public beta for Monterey and iPad? July. July. It'll be July. It's usually like a month after they get, okay. they get the first 
developer seeds. Uh, the, the first developer seed comes out at the dub dub at that day, yeah. and then there's usually one, one or two like hot fixes. You know, the ones that come in, the ones that come in red and not blue. I'm gonna so violate. They, they, they avoid the public. I'm those. gonna violate my own rules and probably do that because I have that top of the line M1 iPad, and I really want to use it to its fullest extent. So maybe I'll put. I've the had a few respring's, but it hasn't been catastrophic. Okay, so it's good to know. It's because it'll be even more stable for the public beta, I'm sure. Um, if you plug in, this is from Scooter X, an NTFS formatted, NTFS, that's Windows File System, formatted stick into the iPad. You can now be ready with the Files app. Uh, no, It's read-only, no write, but that's kind of like the iMac. Uh, he also uh, points out, and you'll be happy to know, there is a progress bar on the Files yeah. app on iOS Progress circle. 15, progress, progress circle. Progress circle on, on top of the document icon. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. so some, some steps are being made in the right direction. I agree. The multitasking is going to be very interesting. I, you know, I have some weird fetish for note taking apps. And, uh, yes. And, and I'm really interested by this corner slide up with the notes. I, quick notes. Quick notes. And the fact that it goes, I really feel like. I might. That's something I might actually use all the and time. And it persists. If you go back to a web page, right. your quick note for that web page comes. Love out. that. That yeah. looked super powerful. Super good. The other thing that makes it all work so good is the live text is so so well done. Like it's it's instant. It's it's always actually live because they can use those neural engine processors on the devices that have them. So it'll go back in time and go through your existing photo library the way it did with face recognition, for example. But it'll also, if you go to a web page with a photo on, it'll make that photo instantly available in live text as well. And they trained it with these models that had just all these different types of typeface and handwriting. And then they went through and distorted it and trained it again, skewed it, just trained it again, elongated it, wrapped it around circles and all these things and kept training it. So like you have blurry little text things and, and you can not only co you know select them, copy them. If they're data detectors, you can click the email address or the phone number. All of these things, it just, it, it unlocks all the informational content in every photo you've ever taken. So somebody yeah. told me that at the WWDC for live text, they showed the Simpsons, it reading the Simpsons blackboard. Is that, did you see that? <laughs> yeah, it's so good. Is that, was that at this the is, keynote? This, Oh, it was on iOS Today uh, they did it. That was a session. That was a session, yeah. though, yeah. That's really, yeah. really cool. Yeah, and th this is, to I me, just have this screenshots. was just... I'm sorry. Go ahead. Uh, to, to, to me, this is just as significant as when Apple decided to challenge Google uh, with Maps, because you know that it's whatever they do, very fr first of all, it's going to be rudimentary and maybe functional, but not exciting. But you need to get that equity in before you can get to that uh, the, the, the 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 golden era where now, uh, when you're being able to translate di when you're able to translate language and recognize language, you've got so many international languages, not just international international languages, but individual regional dialects that you're actually doing. That's not the sort of thing that you can do uh, when you first get out of the gate, but you have to get the fundamentals down first. And once Apple gets that functionality that used to be the, the essential domain of Google, that's something that I think that's a, a big chunk that Apple's had missing from its portfolio. The ability to uh, go into like Google Photos and just give it a random word and whatever word you give it, if, if, if it's text on a sign in a picture, if it's contextual in an, in an object or an image, uh, it will be able to find it and, and surface it for you. Apple has not been able to show that kind of uh, that kind of agility and AI yet, like, like fun functional practical AI yet. And I'm glad to see that Apple's starting to get out of the gate with that, despite the fact they've got this great hardware with neural engines that are powering so many features that don't have this big automatic artificial intelligence machine learning sticker in front of it. All the features that are M1 that were work on the M1, but not on the uh, on Intel processors that you think of, geez, how come I can't do this on uh, on Intel? It's because, well, well because it's, it's not using the it's not using the main CPU. It's using all these neural engines to get this work done. So this is I'm, I'm glad that Apple's finding that is putting that club in its bag. Renee, you said you're doing screenshots of the uh, sessions. Yeah, I'm getting confused. It's like I'm in my photos app and I've taken so many screenshots over the years and I just open the screenshot and I start selecting text and I forget that yeah. I'm in a photo. I think I'm on oh the actual website. I can't because wait it's working to do just the way the this. website works. 
Es- uh. Especially because you're, you're probably like me where it's like, especially during a keynote, it's like you're taking screenshots yes. of slides to get things. And then I'm just, I, and I've had exactly the same experience where I'm just like randomly three months later saying, oh God, I need to, what's, I need, I need to know what the clock speed of this thing is. And I was expecting to find like it surface a note that I just wrote to myself while I was, while I was doing research. Like, no, here's the actual, sc- actual screenshot of the actual slide when they were giving all the stuff in that eight, that, that blip vert that they gave during the keynote. That's the sort of stuff that turns you from a, turns the machine from a practical tool to what feels like an assistant that's looking out for you and trying to uh, get ahead of your work for you. Yeah. Wow. I and can't, I don't make I typos anymore because we'd have to retype all that stuff that was like in a locked away slide. Right. And I would always like transpose letters or get numbers mixed up. And now I just copy and paste it. And I, I can't blame no that. No one to blame. That anymore. stinks. So <laughs> how does it do with like handwriting and, uh, I mean, obviously, the text has to be pretty well formed for this, right? Well, um, because they tr- they use the same. It's based on the same system they used for Scribble. Uh, you know, oh, all right. Philosophically, based on the same system they used for Scribble. Uh, so, um, and Apple's very you know proud of the fact that they don't ever harvest user data for this. So they just go out it's and all in, on, buy on or, or 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 self source yeah. tons of samples and then run them through machine learning and then do a d- bunch of different deformations like stretching, compressing, skewing, wrapping, all these things, and then retrain. So they said that they. They can get more. They can get so many models out of just like even a, a commercial sampling set that they, they've made it really robust. So you've been able to do uh, do do it with pretty much anything. I love it that it takes your old photos and does that. Yeah, that's yeah, amazing. And it's fast. I, I wish it would be great if uh, uh, I'm not faulting Apple for not necessarily publicizing what data sets they're using to train these things. I, 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 that's something that stuck out to me as well, Renee, that they're, the fact they can do something this well by simply buying data, buying or leasing data sets as opposed to collecting information, which is actually, which again is a privacy sort of moment, but it leads to a real world sampling of what your users are doing with uh, with handwriting or with speech uh, or with photos. Um, Tim DeGibru, who uh, of course, was fired from Google uh, because of um, shady for shady reasons on Google's part uh, yeah. w- uh, related to a paper that uh, was then published. I think I think the paper was called Sto- "Dangers of so- Stochiac- so- Stochastic Parrots." Parrots. Stochastic Parrots. Yeah. Thank you very much. And this is one of the problems that she was that this paper, which she wrote with three other researchers, was pointing out that unfortunately the publicly available data sets they are very very like male based culturally isolated they're not uh, they don't reflect just about it. they don't reflect the entire community world community they just affect the community of people who contributed to that data set which tend to be very very monotheistic and so that's going to be a problem that apple will have to deal with as they're doing this but uh, as if we've anybody seen could, so many, apple will I, you know. ex- exactly as as we've Google's, seen in so many Google's other things response apple to this was to fire the researchers yeah. Well, I think because, Apple will do better. <laughs> yeah. I hope anyway. Here's the uh, clip from uh, iOS Today with uh, Rosemary Orchard demonstrating live text. On my iPad. Um, and somebody posted this tweet. And uh, so for people who are watching at home, um, then they might not be able to tell. Um, this but is a, a picture she, of Bart Simpson, the opening credits from the she's Simpsons. She's selecting where Bart has to write lines on the text. Button. It's always yeah. something funny. From In this case, it's... I must not install bases on my main device. This is a very good and piece whole of advice lines for of all of you, text. Uh, unless you're near my cat. She's so look, actually able selected. to select that. Must now it's a fairly regular. On my main device. I will copy that. Switch back to drafts. Uh, remove that word. There, look yes. at that. I don't let you copy text that well across columns. Right look here. at that. I just copied that out of yeah. a picture. That is no so amazing, Rosemary. That was really a great demo. So... I'm excited. I mean, I have to, by the way, and somebody in the chat room is pointing this out. Thank you, Web1802 or 7802. Um, that unlike Google, I mean, yeah, Google Lens does this. Microsoft has Office Lens that does this. But unlike Google, Apple's exposing an API that will let any app on iOS do it. And that's a big deal. And that's yeah. a big difference. Um, and it forces them to do it privately as well. Like that way, when it, Apple's been very clever about that, this WWDC, they've made almost everything that they do, including parental controls, including all the lens stuff, including all of the frameworks for their private relay stuff, uh, including their, their new notification suppression system, their focus thing. And they're like, you get permission for this, but you have to follow these privacy regulations. And if the user thinks that you're abusing it, they get to turn you off. You know, which is what they, which Apple could not do if people were rolling their own versions of these or using some sketchy SDK from a third party uh, yeah, to do it. Yeah. Uh, so okay, maybe I will. <laughs> I guess I'll do the public beta. I'm not going to do it on my iPhone, <laughs> but but I will. I think I will do it on the uh, on the I'm iPad. I'm running it on my iPhone, but I'm a, a well known fool. Yeah. 
Your main phone, like your your actual phone, the yeah. phone you use, the Every phone year, people Leo, call you sometimes on. I, sometimes I'm stuck with no signal and nothing, but you know, <laughs> other times it's great. Well, keep us up to date on how it's working because by July, I don't, I would, I would definitely say, I mean, I guess if you have a developer account, which you need to do this, you know, you're smart enough to know whether this is a good idea. Right. So what I do is I look at engineers that I know, and if I see them doing any form of a head shake twitch, I do not put on the band. Yeah. <laughs> but if they're smiling, yes. yeah. If they're smiling, then I go ahead. Like 2019, yeah. I did not. 2020, yeah, 2020. There have been years where it has been a bad idea. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Oh, yeah. But Let me they, they have a very. Go ahead. Ever since they've split, ever since they've split it apart from uh, general beta release to no, this is a developer beta, but this is a public beta. They've actually in the past few years, at least in the past few years, there have not been many scary. Actually, I don't think there've been any scary showstoppers. We, the, I mean, the, the 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 lady with the lamp in the middle of the harbor and this entire thing is. Oh, remember that beta of macOS that actually destroyed all your the data in your hard drive? But that was like ten years ago, uh, and that's the. It's enough to make sure that you understand the the rights and responsibilities of running beta software. But I would say that if there's a specific feature that really think would would turbocharge your workflow. It's worth at least trying. Do do one hell of a backup first, and make sure you have a. You're not doing it on the the on a day that uh, that uh, you're kind of hosed if things go south on you. But I would not necessarily dissuade people from from installing a public beta, again with with certain caveats installed. Uh, Co uh, Captain Jack in our uh, Discord. Our uh, Club Twit Discord says that ba his battery life is suffering on the iPhone and the watch on the beta, that it's noticeably yes. different. So, and that's Usually. not unusual. So you should be aware of that right. if you're going to do no. it. Because they're running a bunch of stuff in the background, like right. they're running a bunch of bug collect. Like, none of the code yeah. is optimized for performance. It's all optimized for de like developer yeah. beta. <laughs> right. Do not explode. Right. Right. <laughs> but yeah. you know, so again, my suggestion, unless you're a developer, in which case you know what you're doing, to wait until next month, and we'll get a report from Renee. <laughs> When he when the public beta comes out, and we'll just watch him twitch or not, and then that's what Dalrymple does. He te he texts me going, "Did you put it on? Does it work?" And I'm like, "Yeah." And he's like, "Act like you." And he goes, "Now." I'm like, "Now well, it's Renee." Renee is definitely the first penguin we all shove off the ice floe. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and and if there is float? like bubbles of bl of blood, then okay, then we'll, uh, we'll, we'll go wait, in. We'll wait. <laughs> uh, WWJD. What would Jim Dalrymple do? JDD. Uh, Tell me. <laughs> look, look to look to Renee here. Can't say no. It's Jim. See if he's floating. <laughs> <laughs> we will t we will tell your story, Renee. Thank you for your sacrifice. Thank you. Oh, with a stick, bye, takes a Renee. And then We're a back great penguin. <laughs> <laughs> hey, our show. Let's take a little break. More to come. Lots more to talk about. Renee Ritchie, uh, Andy Anako, Alex taking the day off. He had some important business to do, but he'll be back next week. Our show today brought to you by Audible. I love Audible. Andy, I know you love Audible, too. Oh, There's, yes. You've missed being able to talk about our Audible picks of the week. <laughs> I am now knee-deep in the Wheel of Time series. Uh, all of them extremely lengthy. I finished the first one uh, a mere 26 hours. I think some of them are even longer. But I love, for me, what I love with Audible, I love immersing myself in an audiobook. Uh, because and Audible does a great job on the Wheel of Time. They have multiple narrators, and they it's just really well done. And I just really, I'm really loving it. And I'm in that world, you know? And that's one of the things an audiobook, I think, can do for you, uh, is immerse you in that experience. While you're at the beach, you better believe we're going to Hawaii next month. I'm taking Audible. And it's not just audiobooks. Uh, oh, man, Audible Plus has all kinds of content. Now, if you're looking for a summer partner to take along on your next trip now that we are going out of the house. Actually, I listened to just as much Audible when I was stuck in the house, maybe more. Now's the absolute best time to do it. Prime members, if you're an Amazon Prime member, you can save 53% on your first four months. So that is a big offer right now only from Audible. With Audible, you can listen to more of whatever you're into because Audible has it all, an unbeatable selection of audiobooks, tons of binge-worthy podcasts, many ad-free, exclusive originals, uh, like Project Hail Mary, which is an Audible exclusive. Andy Weir loves Audible. He gave them their right to record it, and man, it is a great, great listen. almost said read. Listen. Lisa just finished it, too, and we loved it. All available to download or stream on your phone, on your device, we listen to Audible on our HomePods, on my HomePod Mini. 
because it uh, comes right off of the iPhone. It's just great. As an Audible member, you could choose a title a month, like the latest bestseller, the hottest new release, yours to keep forever. But you also get full access to Audible's streaming library. That's the Plus catalog I mentioned. Discover your next podcast obsession. Check that audiobook off your bucket list. Get lost in a world of original content from celebrity creators, best-selling authors, leading experts, the classics, the classics too, like Robert Jordan's amazing Wheel of Time series. This is the kind of stuff you just don't get anywhere else. Stream all you want, as much as you want. It's the perfect companion for summer. Because, you know, even when I'm riding my bike, I have audio in my helmet, and I play Audible through <laughs> my helmet. When I'm barbecuing, especially those long smokes, when I have a when I have a when I'm when I'm doing a, a brisket, you better believe Audible comes along. What are you listening to these days, uh, Andy? Uh, I'll tell you what I just downloaded yesterday: Invisible Women, Data Bias in a World Designed for Men. Uh, just showing how uh, pervasive these problems are. About how there was this uh, like a, a town meeting, a town board of supervisors meeting uh, in the uh, in the, uh, in Northern Europe. At which they're talking about exactly this issue, and one of the commissioners was like joking around, saying, "Josh, at least at least our snowplows don't show any gender bias." And then they said, "Huh? Actually, we haven't looked at that." And they looked at that, and they discovered that well, there actually is because uh, we send our snowplows out to plow highways and like main thoroughfares to like businesses first, when disproportionately uh, women like are taking public transportation or walking or their own personal transportation. We should like shift some of we should shift some of the priority to local streets and. Sidewalks, and after they did that, they found out that they were actually saving a lot of money <laughs> by like people in the, in the in the local economy. And this is the sort of stuff that never for 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 most people, including people who look and sound like me, it doesn't occur to you, even if you feel as though you're you're, you're a pretty aware person. And it needs you need these case studies and someone who is this uh, who can communicate uh, about them in such a broad way to really really open your eyes wider than uh, they've been opened before. It's always dangerous when I go to the Audible sites. And yep. then I ran across yep. this bitter blood, Kasem versus Kasem, <laughs> uh, a podcast about the bitter battle over Casey Kasem's uh, inheritance. Uh, he left about $100 million when the great American DJ passed and his family fought bitterly over it. Uh, I, you know what? Going to have to add that. The nice thing is that's included with my Audible Plus subscription. So it's an easy thing uh, to add. Audible's just great. I just finished The Eye of the World. 29 hours and 57 minutes. So let's call it 30 hours. Oh, good. The one I'm in the middle of now, The Great Hunt, is only 26 hours. Then the next one's 24 hours. The next one's 41 hours. It's like he was getting paid by the, by the word. But I tell you what, it's great listening. <laughs> Audio books, I just love them. I've been an Audible member since 2000. That's a lot. It's 21 years of Audible. <laughs> yep. And I have never regretted one minute of it for a limited time amazon prime members you could save 53 percent on four months of audible just 6.95 a month if you're not an amazon prime member go to audible and sign up so for amazon prime so you can get this deal and much more get out of summer with audible prime day's coming up isn't it next week take advantage of an incredible limited time offer go to audible.com slash mac break a-u-d-i-b-l-e audible.com slash mac break and if that uh, prime deal has ended because you're listening to this podcast later, uh, don't worry. You can uh, try Audible Plus for 30 days with a free trial at audible.com slash MacBreak. That's actually a great way to do it because you can listen to hundreds, I think thousands of different audio content. Um, so it's a really great way to sample Audible. Or you can just text MacBreak to 500-500. That's the short code, 500-500. Text MacBreak or audible.com slash MacBreak. We love Audible. We really do. It's genuine. Thank you, Audible, for... Uh, returning to our show and supporting our podcast. Thank you for supporting the podcast by going to audible.com slash Mac break. That makes a big difference. It really does. Uh, okay. I, I wanted to ask Renee about this one and I don't know if you have a thought on it or not. The secret M1 Apple coprocessor is kind of a link baity title, but a developer named Dougal Johnson has discovered that there is a, a matrix coprocessor, the AMX, Apple Matrix coprocessor, inside the M1 that is not neither documented nor revealed. And the basic explanation of this is that ARM, which Apple has an ARM architecture license, ARM allows companies to add additional microcode, but not to make it public because they don't want to fragment the ARM, you know, ecosystem. So... 
uh, a company like Apple can say, look, what we really need is more instructions like matrix processing instructions, which are used for artificial intelligence and gaming, all sorts of stuff. We want to add some instructions. We keep them private in a private library. Developers have access to it through the library, but it doesn't fragment the ecosystem. And that's, I think, correct me if I'm wrong, what this AMX is doing. Is that right, I Renee? Mean, Did I, I get I that right? I the premise... Yeah, but I, I beg the premise of the article uh, or the the discovery because Apple's been really upfront about the AMX. They've had it up on stage oh. numerous oh. times. Well, never They've mind. They pointed it out. They've, it was just link bait. Yeah, then. no, like, got I, me. I, I really didn't get. Yeah, um, they, but the reason, like, the thing is that, and it, it 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 highlights another part of the part of the problem is that for some reason Apple people some people don't want to give Apple any credit for like the M1 or the A14 or any of these. Oh, it's so just ARM. They, they it, just they took say, oh, the ARM. ARM chip. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but like when they talk about AMD they never say oh the x86. They just they say AMD or they say Intel. Right. Like I just say Apple like because that's the parody here. No one's looking at a PS5 and saying, "Oh, that's such great x86 inside that thing." It's no, it's a really good um AMD uh, CPU uh, for uh, SOC, and and one of the reasons is Apple switched from their design license after the A5 and got an architecture license, and they have, as far as I know, one of the most permissible architecture licenses available, yeah. and they can do all sorts of custom things with it. And the whole reason ARM is doing V9 now, the upcoming ARM V9 uh, instruction set architecture, is to backport a lot of the things Apple did because they were <laughs> such a high volume premium. Like they, they just had to solve a lot of problems that ARM hadn't had to solve yet they are bringing all of those things or many of those things like the security the neural technology all of those to everybody at arm not in exactly the same way but they thought good ideas let's propagate them but a lot of that stuff it's 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 an arm instruction set that apple is using is a very small part of the cpu that they're still using and yeah. i find all this, this the banter around it fascinating so is, is it the case then that there are there are probably many more extensions like this to the architecture that just you know apple for, for completely appropriate reasons, keeps to itself. Does that make sense? That this is just one of many. Yeah, like I, I'm sure the I like they they keep their silicon IP really t like people go and shoot the dies, you know, for a reason. Right. Um, but the case of the of the AMX, the Apple Matrix uh, multipliers, they decided that just a, an Apple neural engine wasn't enough. That there were some cases where the CPU was better tasked or the GPU right. was better tasked. So they created a machine learning controller, the same way they had a performance controller to decide which tasks needed big cores versus small cores. They have a machine learning controller that decides this this particular AI task is better suited for the compute cores in the CPU or the compute cores in the GPU or the, the dedicated cores in the ANE. And then it moves things around. It, it round trips them. And because of unified memory, it's an incredibly efficient process. And that gives them a lot of advantages. But it's like this has been on slides for two, three years already. It's so good I'm link bait and I fell for it. I mean, I have to say for years, I bought the Windows Secrets books for the same reason. Secret APIs have always been a fascination of developers. Apple and Microsoft both have done this for years and you know sometimes they're accused of keeping them to themselves like we have a secret api so that our programs will work better than your programs i don't think that's the, ever been the case with apple they they expose those in the libraries and uh, you don't have to know about amx it just happens automatically just like all microcode well, happens abstracted right yeah unless you're writing yeah, assembly it language it's always against. abstracted yeah so and i don't think that... apple move things around under the covers like we just see the interface but they can keep changing the pipes they can put in better pipes right. and your stuff still works because you're not targeting a pipe right. you're targeting the junction in front of it well and, yeah. and in fact um for years there have been hidden or deprecated api calls even uh, and yeah. Apple will say, don't use these. And for years, developers have used them anyway. And then their software breaks when the new operating system comes out or new hardware comes out. And they get all if up in arms. Like but you shouldn't have used them. The Apple well, Watch moved from 32-bit to 64-bit with zero developer stress at all. It was managed because of bit code. Yeah, and that's yeah. remarkable in today's yeah, yeah. architecture yeah. world. Just, just quickly, to, to be fair, the reason why people, uh, developers, t keep using these old APIs is because they work. Yeah, and, and they're faster they, they, often. They, yeah, they, they they work, and oftentimes when Apple gives them something they want to replace it with, that thing doesn't work, or right. it's not appropriate for uh, for their task. Uh, and just uh, just getting back a, a moment to uh, talking about, oh well, Apple has this special coprocessor that they they haven't documented. Uh, that's uh, that's 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 bunkum, of course. But of course, the they also do they also hold certain entitlements 
uh, for for app permissions to themselves, so that they can, their apps can do things that they don't let other third party apps do, or that will only let us very very small handful of blue chip apps do this do this function this one way or give them an exception to uh, an app store rule for for API use that they won't let the general public use uh, in the developer community. So that's oftentimes one of the reasons why the reasons why if there is like a metal cabinet anywhere near a developer's desk and it has a he forehead shaped dent in it, that's one of the reasons <laughs> why that dent is there. Uh, yeah. uh, so uh, I'm I I have to say I think uh, Apple is has kind of has his house in order with regard to this. And, uh, and the Gee Rambos find this stuff anyway. Like within three minutes of a new beta coming out, anything that they <laughs> yep. didn't tell us is is posted on the internet anyway. Yeah. Yep. There is the issue, though. Um, in fact, uh, I just read a really good uh, article on. Let me see if I can uh, pull it up. Um, on of of documentation, the uh, this is from the Eclectic Light Company blog. The elephant at WWDC. Uh, he he re reminds us that in the early years of the Mac. It had the best documentation ever. It had a full series of books. In fact, I have yeah. at home the Inside Macintosh, uh, published by Addison Wesley, written by people like Scott Canaster and really good technical authors working with Apple's engineers. They, they, they were so elegant and so beautiful, and it was so much fun to code on a Mac because it was so well documented. Apple's kind of fallen away from this a little bit. Uh, he points out that the documentation for the Apple file system, APFS, is zero to terrible and uh and you know basically unusable but apple is attempting and on the other hand there's the platform security guide which is very well written and the um, new inclusivity guidelines from the yeah, interface yeah, are yeah. amazing so but he said one of the things uh that he did note uh this year is that apple is recognizing the problem and is starting to do a better job of uh, documenting um, they were incredibly undermanned for, like, especially when Apple split out into the multiple operating systems. Before, like, they really had to document iOS and Mac OS. Yeah, that was about it. And then they went through this rapid expansion of adding Watch OS and TV OS as a distinct thing. Um, and now they have, you know, things that are basically Audio OS. And yeah, there's there's so much. And that their teams were so traditionally so small. Apple had bankruptcy mentality for so long, and also you know individual incubator startups within the company mentality that they just did not have enough bodies to throw at this stuff. And I think they yeah. recognized that two years ago, it was so painful, so painful with lack of documentation that they're trying to be more aggressive in, in building that up. But I think just based on Apple's culture, the way they run things, they don't disclose people like really early. Like there's a whole bunch of things that get in the way of this stuff and they're going to have to really figure it's it out. It's hard. Well, it's historically very hard. The last thing a programmer wants to do is, is write documentation. Um, he, he says uh, that this new uh, DOCC framework, this developer documentation framework, I guess it's DOCC is probably how I should read it, which is a documentation compiler that started in Xcode 13, allows you to do something called literate programming. I've been a fan of uh, literate programming since Donald Knuth wrote about it. Uh, was it Scientific American? He wrote a published an article. The idea being, instead of writing code, you basically are writing the documentation with bits of code in the documentation and use a right. tool that will then compile the documentation and, and in effect, you've, you've written the documentation while you're writing the code. And that's what DOCC does. It converts markdown-based text into rich documentation for the Swift frameworks and uh, packages as they're writing it. Um, and so there's a lot of promise here. Um, he points out uh, DOC, uh, DOCC, I always said DOCC, DOCC looks exciting and demonstrates that Apple recognizes its problem. But then he points out a, f a few traps. Um, but this is um, this is going to be very uh, interesting to see if if he follows if Apple follows through on this because this is probably the right way to write code. You just have to convince developers they need to start uh, writing literate code. Mm. Um, and and you know what? It's good for everybody. He writes, C is really in a plaintive cry for help." Teams are still trying to fill the yawning chasm. Ironically, one of the best new man pages I've read in a long time is that for BP Util, a command tool which Apple, Apple repeatedly warns shouldn't be used except experimentally. But, <laughs> but those are exceptions. For every instance like that, there are tens of man pages which haven't been updated for years and now don't match their usage information. Um, two failings still trouble Apple and its amazing products, bugs and documentation. 
without squaring up to both and changing course, they can only get worse. I think Apple has a path forward. I think that's the point of Doxy. Yeah. I hope that it continues. Yeah. It's, it's too bad. This is kind of a recurring problem that cuts across a lot of different oh, products. Everybody has problems. this problem. Yeah. Well, no, I'm, I'm not, I'm not just uh, the, the specific problem we've been talking about, where, but where Apple, who has uh, immense resources, who if they want to create a, a car division, they can hire up and create a car division. But you often hear about, uh, well, the reason why this feature is late for was was late for Mac OS because they had to pull all kinds of all kinds of Mac OS team members off to get iPad OS or to get iOS running. It, it, it's it, I do feel I do agree that I think that there's a shortage of of bodies working on documentation and other simple things, and I think that one of the one of the few logistical problems that Apple has traditionally had is they don't know how to put bodies into, into the right seats, how to add seats to the right offices to make sure everything runs smoothly. They had not one, not two, not three, but four sessions at WWDC about using DocC. So I'm, yeah. I'm very hopeful. This is kind of what it will look like, which is you're, you're writing in your comments, uh, you're writing uh it's 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 more than just good comments. Ultimately, what what I think the goal of literate programming is to write prose that turns into code, but uh, but good commenting would be a start, and then the compiler will automatically extract that. Uh, that's widely done uh, in other uh, platforms. It's widely done in, in Unix as well in open source. So, Doc C, let's do it, guys. Let's get on it. I'd love to touch talk to Rich Siegel. We got to get Rich on again. Um, yes, I'd lo love Paris. to talk to him. He, he's in Paris? No, no. Oh, he's and he's parrots. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Someone, I, I, I'll, I, I'm, I'm just messaging him now just to tell I, him that we're, we're, we're saying, we're, we're saying nice things about him. And I'd love parrots. to know, you know, what he thinks about all of this because he's, this is a, this is the, he's the inside, you know, inside. I'm sure he has he, the whole inside Mac bookshelf. He's the original, you know. Rich, Rich Siegel, there's, there, if there's a Justice League of, uh, of Apple programmers out there, uh, men, women, every kind, that have been doing this for 20 years, that know it inside and out, they know the culture inside and out, they have the requisite dents in the file cabinets in their offices, uh, and they are the people that when Apple, that really when they start, when they, when they make a blog post about a problem they're having, it can set the world on fire because they don't, they, they know it, they, everyone knows that they know what they're talking about and they don't just fly off like uh, half tea kettled uh, on things like that. So yeah, he's rich is definitely in that justice league. And for those who don't know, BB edit is his bare bones software. And yes. BB edit is his baby. The classic, the classic, the greatest text editor of all time. Uh, Billboard magazine interviews Eddie Q <laughs> about spatial <laughs> audio. And uh, in, in, in which at one point, <laughs> Eddie says, nobody's going to, nobody's going to know the difference. <laughs> He says, well, the, real lossless. <laughs> the reality of lossless. Well, I, oh, I'm sorry, not spatial, lossless. Thank you for correcting yeah. me. Yes. Uh, lo lossless, high bit rate audio. He says, the reality of lossless is if you take 100 people and you take a stereo song and lossless and you take a song that's been in Apple Music that's compressed, I don't know if it's 99 or 98 that can't tell the difference, but I think that's probably true. Most people cannot tell the difference. There's some people who can. Especially over AirPods. Yeah. Now we're supporting lossless. We think there's a set of customers. It's a small set of customers, but they want it. We'll certainly give it to them, and they'll have it as part of this. The good news is they'll have lossless, and they'll have Dolby Atmos and spatial. And I think uh, Apple's right to kind of focus on spatial as opposed to uh, lossless. So I took the time uh, last week of playing Apple spatial music on every platform I have. <laughs> <laughs> I, and in fact, I spent some money because I went out and got the $550 Apple AirPods Max because I thought, well, I should really hear what Apple's kind of, that's the reference for it, right? The reference platform is this AirPods Max. For spatial audio, yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, I don't consider AirPods Max a high fidelity uh, reproduction system. They're not very good, but that's probably because they're Bluetooth. And, yes. uh, you know, Bluetooth is, is limited. It's highly compressed music, and it really sounds that way. It's a little muddy from my ears. They were designed to make the best Bluetooth possible, but you're still limited by <laughs> still Bluetooth. Bluetooth. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah. So I also played it back using a, a high-quality DAC on uh, a $300 pair of Sennheiser uh, in-ears, which are very, very good, the IE300s, and on my $1,000 electrostatic Hi-Fi Man uh, HT560s. And on a variety of speaker systems in my car, which has a premium audio system from B&O, and of course on my, uh, on my good system uh, using my ELAC uh, speakers. And I, I guess I would, what I would say is 
And I think this is Apple's kind of Apple's point, certainly the point of Zane Lowe in the introduction. And by the way, the Marvin Gaye thing is a really good way to introduce it, that spatial is to stereo what stereo was to mono, or close to, maybe not quite as much, but it's a, it's a step forward. It's much more open. Um, uh, you you sound you don't sound like you're listening on headphones. You sound like listening in a room. And by the way, I can even hear it on stereo speakers. Although one thing I know, and I don't know, Renee, maybe they gave you some information on this. I do have a Dolby system, not an Atmos system, but a Dolby system, which will play surround sound with uh, the Apple TV on things like Roger Waters' Us and Them. But when I play Apple Music, spatial audio through the Apple TV, they report stereo. I think spatial is for stereo, despite the Dolby Atmos. Name. They'll try to do it. So if they're on both sides, so if they have an Atmos signal, they'll just use that for spatial mapping. If they don't, they'll try to do that computational but audio. It's, it's not sending an Atmos signal to my stereo, which would see it. Not, yeah, not on Apple TV. On Apple TV, you need a Dolby Atmos capable, I believe. No, um, I do. Receiver. I, I have a, Dol a, yeah. a, a Apple updated Apple TV connected to a Dolby. It's not Atmos. It's Dolby. But yeah, I, I think you do need that. the Atmos. For Does the it have to be Atmos? The like it's the only earphones, but I don't believe. Uh, I don't believe it's any receiver. Because if I'll I listen to a Dolby, watch a Dolby movie, I get the surround five one surround seven one surround. Yeah. But, uh, but you're saying it's that spatial in, will not, unless your decoder does Atmos. Okay. I believe, I'm, I'm going to double check that. I believe that, it, I mean, it's, 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 and also some of the Dolby Atmos songs are just not good. And I think they've, they've admitted it as much. Like some of the artists have been incredibly engaged well, in going exactly in and taking the original tracks expect. and choosing yeah. what they want. And yeah. others are just, ah, here you go. And it's like, no, you made all the wrong, why did you even do this? Yeah. I mean, that's what happened. Remember when CDs came out. Uh, yes. <laughs> there were some really bad CD masters because they just said, well, I'll take these tapes and put them on a CD, kid. <laughs> Pay them 10 bucks an hour and we'll get them all done. Um, although Eddie points out that the labels ha have uh, a lot of interest. Um, and it's true that they launched with hundreds and hundreds of songs in every genre. I was surprised. Yeah. I didn't expect so many songs. And they want to get on those playlists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants to be on the playlist, right? I think they sound good. I think when it's done properly, it's a little better than stereo. Let's put it that way. <laughs> How's that? <laughs> Would you agree, Depends, Renee? What's me, your experience? Like if, if I could, for me, it's like if this song is a song that I would love to be in a concert hall to hear. Um, you know, like, like I'm not Andy. Like I'm not, I'm not into opera, but I am into like big John Williams and Howard Shore uh, and Alan Silvestri, you know, theatrical compositions. And if I can listen to that as though I'm in the middle of the theater where they're playing with a full orchestra and the sound is literally all around me, I really, really, really enjoy that. Other songs, it doesn't make a real difference to me. Like, yes, I can appreciate. And if you haven't heard it, there's a Serenity Caldwell. She got to do a musical play at Apple, which is just the peak of Serenity Caldwellness, I think, of all time, uh, where they're demonstrating the spatial audio API and the features. And you hear them talking, and you hear Serenity out in the background behind you saying, Is this really a thing? Does this really make a difference? And then she moves around to another place. And I can totally appreciate that. Uh, the same way that, you know, I could, I, I, when I watched HD during the transition, I had to go back to looking at my parents' CRT display. I could tell it wasn't bad. For some shows, I really didn't care, you know, like the local news and things like that. And that's how I feel right now. It's like the best of it is amazing. Uh, some of it does, does not make a big deal to me, but I look forward three or four years and I think, Going back, I'll be like, people used to listen to music like this. What were we animals? <laughs> so I'm I'm actually I'm actually more in, more excited about it, and I'll try to make this really short because it's something I'm going to be I'm, I'm I'm preparing something long writing about it. I'm actually more excited about spatial audio finally as a way of doing audio AR. I've always thought that uh, uh, AR glasses are not w the way to go. The way to go are earbuds that can let you talk to a, a voice assistant and get your information and your inputs and output that way. But imagine. Being able also being able to say, hey, where is the? Uh, how do how do I how do I get to uh, how do I get to the post office? And it actually will put a ping like behind you and to the left, saying, turn around until like this is actually in front of you. That's the direction down the street you need to go. That's I'm not I'm not as we said last week. I mean, I'm not terribly excited about it as a musical thing yet, uh, unless I upgrade my headphones. But it's a great technology. I just think they could be used in interesting and unexpected ways. You shouldn't, by the way, have to update your headphones. That's I right. guess what I'm saying yeah. is. Uh, it worked fine. 
coming. You have to tell your iPhone always use spatial because it because otherwise it talks to the headphones. Says, Can you do Atmos? And the headphones go no. And then you go okay. Well, we'll just but you do won't stereo. Do the head tracking unless you have the head tracking you know, the is Apple. dopey. Yeah. I'm sorry, I don't see any point to head tracking. <laughs> So the it's, TV's here, and I turn my head. To. The sound moves to the right. Is dumb. I it makes it. It makes headphones work the way speakers work. That's essentially the only. Yeah, the only thing I don't. I don't see that was the original use of spatial. I never really saw the point of that. But I am interested in a sound that is more authentic. I guess. So you do have to turn Dolby Atmos always on in the sound setting and the music settings, and then you can use any pair of headphones. I used a, a good quality DAC. And as I said, just regular headphones. And you definitely hear the difference. It's there. Um, so I don't, I guess, is the phone or the iPad or the Mac doing the decoding? I guess so. And send, it, and, and yeah, turning it into some sort of binaural representation for the headphones. I think they describe that it's not, it's based on time, like the time of the signal. Yeah. Uh, when they time the different parts of it, your ear thinks that they're further or closer away. Yeah. So they mess with the timing of when all the different things are being played. It also is the Very case, minute scales, of uh, according, uh, according to Scooter X, that Apple does say you need a Dolby Atmos decoding receiver. It can't just be Dolby, apparently, yeah. which is dopey because I've always thought Dolby Atmos was dopey. You have to have downward firing <laughs> speakers. Uh, that's Not anymore. The I mean, they kind of they've they've kind of flattened that down so they can sim they can they're really good at simulating 3D sound stages now so the original one was very manual like you had to actually point the speakers all these different directions and now they build these 3D sound stages using the same kind of digital tricks that they're using for headphones well if dolby hadn't tarnished its name by selling the the phrase dolby to a bunch of crappy speakers on laptops i might have yeah. been more <laughs> i might have been more encouraged by it uh, i've never spent the i have dolby surround i just don't have dolby atmos also, because I don't want to put speakers in my ceiling. Um, and it's it's weird that Apple's leaning so heavily on Dolby for both Dolby Vision on the iPhone and Dolby Atmos, you know, with all the audio stuff, because they have their own versions. Like the app, because they can't always count on you having a Dolby thing at the end or having a Dolby stream, you know, coming in. So they do their own spatial audio. I think they just, there's no standard for any of this stuff. So they're leaning on, on, on Dolby to... I don't know what the right word is, commoditize the experience. Yeah, that's uh, a good so that word for a it. common reference point. <laughs> that's a very good word yeah. for it. So, well, they, they were better. They were substantially better than the pre... Like HDR10 was not good until Dolby Vision came Dolby out. Dolby Vision is H better. HDR I agree. HDR10 Plus. Dolby Vision yeah. is quite good. I agree. Um, so what I'm getting from this is that Dolby Atmos is a new kind of Dolby that may or may not require uh, downward firing speakers... But everything else is different too. It's not Dolby Stereo or Dolby Surround Plus speakers it's up there. It's not dependent <laughs> anymore. It's like like I, I understand I, I they don't the have to have those speakers. Like, is it nine point one? Is if it I don't point? have and there's no no no. If I don't have downward or upward bouncing speakers, will Dolby Atmos yeah. sound any different than Dolby Dolby uh, Surround? Yeah, because they're 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 doing all that understanding of so where that three D sound okay. space understand. Yeah, like again, audiophiles will spend the money because no, I have real Dolby Atmos. I have the actual physical, yeah. you know, sound waves blasting off my ceiling. So now I have but the to home get pods were a like new the receiver, of all I guess. This. <laughs> if you care about it from your from well, your, like you could put on headphones and listen to it on your iPhone. Yeah, I mean it's, uh, it's weird. It sounds good. I think it's good. It's it's more it's more open. It sounds more open. It's the best way I can describe it. So, uh, and well, with the AirPods Pro, it sounds like it's in your skull, and then with the AirPods Max, it sounds like you're inside the, the, the yes, the hall, exactly. The that's a good hall. way to describe it, and that's always been the problem with uh, headphones in general. Is you know the the very close nature of the sound makes you feel like it's in your head, and uh, some people don't like that. Actually, I don't. I, I don't mind yeah. the headphones, and I've listened to headphones. Some people find life. it, um, yeah, constrictive. So I'm going to have to, uh, okay, I'm going to have to rethink about what Dolby Atmos is. It sounds like it's a new kind of encoding. It's like HDR for audio, like Dolby, Dolby Vision. And I'm, I'm butchering this and everyone at Dolby is going to be super angry at me. But like Dolby Vision just gives you richer detail in your, vi in your video. And Dolby Atmos gives you richer, like more, more 3D space in your audio. So this is from whatHiFi.com. Atmos is a surround sound technology. It was originally developed in 2012. It expands upon the existing 5.1 and 7.1 surround sound setups with surround channels coming from overhead. Um, 
which is was always my understanding. But what I missed was yeah. if you don't have speakers overhead, it will simulate that in some form. And that's I think what nine point one just wasn't practical for like most humans. Yeah. Um. Okay. <laughs> okay. So I think I think it, like think about it as an abstraction layer instead of having like this is Dolby Atmos and here are the nine point one speakers you need to play it. It's like this is Dolby Atmos and we'll figure out how you get the three D sound stage with whatever equipment you happen to have attached. Yeah. I just need to get a, a new receiver because I don't have anything that, that can decode that. I do have the AirPod Max. Pro Max, they're not very good, so I don't really want. I, I don't, you know, what I use it for, which is great, is like FaceTime calls is great, <laughs> but other than that, voice is fine, but it's not good for music, in my opinion. Um, all right, worth worth talking about. And Eddie Q says you can't hear the difference. You can't tell the difference in lossless. Can't handle it. You truth. can't handle it. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. Let's take a little break. More to come. Andy Anaka, Renee Ritchie. Our show brought to you by Udacity. I know you're smart and you want to learn. I know uh, that's one of the reasons we do these shows. I want to learn. And you listen to them because you want to learn. Well, here's a great way to learn, to get the skills that the that tech companies want, skills you might not have learned in school. Udacity is unique in this respect. A part-time online educational program geared for those who are looking to take their technology to the next level. They've got content you can't get anywhere else. They have the nano degree programs. Those nano degrees are designed in conjunction with companies like Microsoft and Google and IBM and Amazon. And in fact, the teachers are team leads at top companies because they know these are the skills you need to get a job at my company. It really makes a difference, and that's why Udacity graduates get great jobs. You can get you, these are classes you probably can't get anywhere else. Flying car, an autonomous flight engineer. I love that. Robotics software engineer. You can learn AI, deep learning, self-driving vehicles, machine learning engineer. Master the latest tech skills and techniques. The courses are hands-on. That's really important. Yes, you're going to watch the videos, the lectures. They're great, but then you're going to have to put. The, what you've learned to end to action. Hands-on, project-based active learning on cutting-edge technology. Projects and homework are always reviewed by qualified professionals. You'll get real human feedback, code reviews, access to mentors too, so you're not on your own 24-7. There's somebody you can say, you can say, I don't get it. Show me this. What is I, what's going wrong? Udacity's flexible schedules mean you can put in just five to ten hours a week working at your own pace anytime because Hey, maybe you got a day job, right? But you can graduate in as little as three months and then get a better job. According to the World Economic Forum, 75 million jobs will be replaced by automated processes in the next three years. If that's you, you need to go to Udacity and prepare for the jobs of the future. 14 million people in over 240 countries. Check out their detailed course listings, udacity.com. I think the projects especially make a huge difference. I've taken some of their courses and actually having to take what you've learned and put it into action. That's, that's what makes the differences. And of course, the great instructors and the great mentors. Flexible payment options. You can learn at your own pace. Free courses available too. And if you are a business, if your team needs to master cutting edge technologies, lots of businesses want their team members to start learning about AI about data science, certainly about cybersecurity. Check out Udacity for Enterprise. You can upskill your entire workforce with real-world project-based learning. Be sure to check out the Enterprise section of Udacity's website today. Get the in-demand tech skills you need to advance your career. Visit udacity.com slash twit. You'll get 75% off any pro... Wait a minute, what? 75% off any program. But this offer ends June 30th. You just got a little more time. 2021. So the offer code for that is TWIT75. This is the best they've, they've offered yet. 75% off any program. The offer code is TWIT75. Offer ends June 30th, 2021. Thank you, Udacity. Thank you for supporting us by using that offer code and that address. Udacity.com slash TWIT. Let them know you heard it here. Offer code TWIT75. Okay. Okay. Apple Design Award winners. We talked about the nominees. We have the winners. I'm not going to run through all of these because 
with great effort, Rosemary Orchard and Micah Sargent did that on iOS today. You should watch that <laughs> because there are a lot of winners. Any Anything you guys want to highlight? I use Nova, which is great. That's a Mac yeah. editor app that I really love. I think Panic Software is so good. Oh, but this is there. Go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to praise Panic that they're. I, 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 yeah. I spoke earlier about how certain developers, individual developers, are like the Justice League. Some are. Some developments co companies are like Tiffany's. <laughs> you know, uh, Mybok, whatever the whatever the the, the 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 companies that you always whatever they they produce, even if it's not something you have any possible use for, you're not necessarily going to buy it, but you're going to take a look at the demo and the videos because they just understand the beauty and the specificity of a Mac or iOS app, and their definite panic is definitely on that list. Oh, amazing! Yeah, there. By the way, did they announce they're going <laughs> to? It was funny. I, I asked a couple of weeks ago, whatever happened to that crank? video game player yep. that they were going to put out and uh did they they apparently had an announcement video huh yep what's a new lonely sandwich video out about it so uh is it coming out i i think i pre-ordered it play yeah it. they say they said that they, they said that the pre-order is going to be opening in july oh i thought uh, i did and oh, there's okay a don't, no, I don't. I don't think so. But also, they they also. I'm. I've never been excited about a game platform, but I'm really excited about this one uh, because they showed off. They showed off. Uh, the video was a little bit more expansive. There's also a new a new desktop or nightstand accessory that's a speaker and a pen holder, and it does. You get a free pen with it, which seems just as silly and ridiculous as I would expect from the play date. Uh, it's, it's the the idea of of if it's the the price has gone up. I think it used to be announced at 150. I think it's gone up to 170. That's fine. But the yeah. but the idea of getting just having these uh, a, a new game a, a season of games just like a season of Ted Lasso where a new game just simply wirelessly appears on this device once a week and the fact that these developers are designing for the specific and quirky piece of hardware and not the usual hey here is your usual like widescreen color touchscreen that could be a computer could be a desktop could be a notebook could be a handheld could be a phone it's like no the the device the hardware is going to de is going to define the experience. Uh, I'm really excited about this. It's, it's very it's retro. I mean, it's black and white. It's kind of pixelated. You've got a crank on the side, which I don't think anybody's ever done that before. So I can't, that's that's what that's what gets me excited because it's, I, I think that I think even didn't in the, in the initial like uh, announcement they specifically said no fishing games because that's the <laughs> one thing that you definitely think don't they're, worry they're, <laughs> they're just they're, and they're not even telling people uh, developers how to use it it's just like here is here is a handheld there is a fold out crank on the side of it <laughs> do with that what you will and you can develop your own apps for it your own games for it so I, I feel as though this is going to be a piece of relaxing fun for me either as a completely like out of his element gamer yeah. or just as, Hey, look, I've got this cool handheld device with a battery, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, and a screen. And I probably am just smart enough to know how to program this. Yeah. Play and dot I date, uh, pre-orders next month. Okay. Yeah. I've def I thought I pre-ordered it. Maybe I just thought I will pre-order it. <laughs> I who, who did I give that money to? <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> I love, there's a lot of little cameos in the video. Like you see Morgan and you see just a lot of the people that you yeah. might recognize from panic Twitter. Oh, uh, nice. Oh, that's great. See again. This is this is why they are just so such superstars. They are there. You wouldn't think that Panic would create the Untitled Goose Game or Firewatch, right. but this but this is the mindset. They're they're like a they're a design house, like a great design houses that you don't you don't understand. You think that they're okay? Well, they make handbags. Well, no, they're a design house. And one thing, excuse me, I'm even better. Like Apple, they are a design studio. They are not necessarily a technology company. It's just that they uh, they uh, they uh, articulate their sense of design and their understanding of the interaction between humanity and the world around them by making these products. And so, I'm sorry, I'm going, I'm, I'm getting a little bit uh, over. Well, it's funny. I'm getting because a little bit too excited. They're kind yeah, of, this, they're this is gush, why I love them. They're kind of legacy. I want to send the money. That's what I'm saying. I know, I do. T shut up and take my money, panic. It's they, uh, they're, they're kind of a legacy, like, like Rich Siegel, kind of a legacy Mac developer. Panic's transmit was a very early FTP. I mean, I think the only thing older than that was Fido. And yeah. uh, very and really good. Well, they had FTP an iTunes client. like client in there. Uh, they did. In fact, I think they did. Somebody said they did uh, uh, double twist. Is that right? Or is that my? Is that no, my they didn't no, double twist. But I believe no. like they had a competitor to what Apple ended up buying and turning into iTunes. Oh yeah, yeah. And then of course, 
I've used as as we said uh, they they've done uh, they did Coda which was a great uh, which yeah, now they so by the way good. sunsetted um, Sound Jam Sound Jam that's right and um, and they've replaced no, that, that, that with the uh, Nova the sorry. unfortunately the um, iPad Code editor oh, the which one? I do use is yeah, gone no, yeah, no, Sound Jam is what Apple bought and turned into iTunes that's right oh that's right Audition oh. uh, Audion oh Audion was great yeah, yeah. was that them Audion yeah. And then Apple bought Sound Jam. Yeah. Right. They're kind of put Audion out of business. So, anyway, back to the design winners. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> In the Sorry. delight and fun category, I want to see. Proceeding was not a sponsored announcement. Yeah, for, really. For software. Yeah, really. <laughs> Uh, well, they win. They won something for Nova, so we'll get to that. But in Delight and Fun, Little Orpheus, the Chinese room, which I will definitely play. I don't know if that's arcade, but uh, must be because it's iPhone, iPad, and Apple TV. That's I think it was one of the yeah one of the announced games in the in the big trailer for arcade. Oh, okay. And then Pock Pock Playroom, uh, so interaction winners, Bird Alone. Um, it's a game that has birds, I guess. And, of course, the snarkiest weather for forecast yeah, program so of all, good. Carrot Weather. Uh, carrots, fantastic. Um, social impact winners. I don't understand what I'm looking at here. Okay, so It's one of those apps that, like, when people complain about Sherlocking, like them and Fantastical, and they just show how you Moriarty Apple right back. Right. Like, you just go so far <laughs> beyond the built-in apps that right. people adore you. Social Impact Winners, Alba, A Wildlife Adventure, and Be My Eyes, which is really uh, amazing. Yeah. Uh, visuals and Graphic Winners, Genshin Impact, which of course is very, very big. And Lo Loona, A Gracefully Animated Sleepscape Session. Okay, okay. In Innovation, League of Legends, Wild Rift. Really the only AAA title here. Uh, Nod Sadana. A studio quality music app. So congratulations to all the winners. I guess Nova was just a finalist. What's I don't understand though, because I don't see who won in that category. So I'm not sure I'm interpreting this properly. Congratulations to all the Apple Design Award winners. That's got to be huge for uh, uh, an app to get that because that that's just people are going to pay attention to it. Yeah. In fact, one of the uh, apps that uh, got that some years ago, which is one of my favorite apps on uh, Mac and iOS, Day One has just been sold. Um, Day One, which is a journaling program, yeah. really beautiful yeah. journaling program. Apple Design Award winner, Apple Editor's Choice, App of the Year. It's it's, it's secure. It works All on the, the accolades. it works on the watch. It works on the Mac. Yeah. It works on your iPhone and iPad. And uh, Automatic just bought them, which actually I, I think is great. I'm a big fan of Matt Mullenweg. The Automatic, uh, of course, is the commercial side of WordPress. And uh, Matt wrote WordPress, and he's turned Automatic into a really great company. That's a very, it's a very harmonious acquisition. I That's, think so. It's like, it's it's like there's sometimes, sometimes there's an acquisition, and you wonder, okay, I guess they just wanted to hire the people that work for there, or I guess they just wanted to get this off the market. There, are, but there are those rare times where there was, a, there there was a day one sized hole in Automatic, and that perfectly drops into it and makes it more complete. So Paul Maine, who's really pretty much single handedly been doing. Day one for uh, a decade, um, uh, says he's going to continue. The team is going to continue. Automatic is just going to give them money and autonomy. And, I, and this is one case where I believe that. WordPress.com and Tumblr are the other automatic um, uh, enterprises. And I think day one fits in quite nicely with that. In fact, a Tumblr inter integration might be great where you could say, hey, this journal post I'd like to make public on Tumblr or WordPress. That would be great. Yeah. So good job, Matt, and uh, good job, Paul. I'm glad. Uh, I'm glad you got acquired. Yeah. Don't know for how much, but I hope it was a billion dollars. <laughs> Sitting on a beat, turning twenty percent. I just I keep saying that. Certainly hope that's the case. And I've been using day one probably for ten years. I've been paying for it since uh, day one. Since day one. Absolutely. <laughs> anyway, that's uh, that's a that's an example of an Apple design winner going on to fame and fortune. Renee, congratulations on still being so quick-witted after a full week of your schedule at <laughs> WWDC. I am impressed. You are the Iron Man of this industry. <laughs> Serenity did a great, speaking of Serenity, did a great job summarizing each. I didn't realize she was like in charge of all content at Apple. Yeah, she's like Serenity a, Caldwell. She's no, like for the developer, big shot. Yeah, the developer app. She's their, she's their developer app evangelist. I, I probably got that wrong. She's going to 
rollerblade <laughs> roller skate chop me, but um, she does all the stuff in the developer app. And so she did the daily uh, summaries like she did last year. And actually, her Memoji did it. I don't know how much she had to do with it, actually. It might have been the Memoji. Her hat and, and hairstyle game was so on point this year, though. <laughs> like, it changed every video. <laughs> uh, all right. Well, but now we got now, now, now we to look at them. Wait a minute. I just got to see here. <laughs> so this is Monday. Go to Apple's YouTube channel. You can see the whole row of them. Hey, everyone. I'm Serenity Caldwell at Apple. It's last year, I think. Went down on oh, is this last year? WWDC. Oh, yeah, it is. 2020. So let's see. the. I want to see the more modern ones. Ones. Here it is. Yeah, she, I think she had a different hat, emoji hat every day. Did she? Oh yeah. Here we go. Here's this or is hairstyle. Uh, yes. Yeah, this is a day two. Buckle up. Your day two recap starts now. I think I've seen her wear that hat though. That's a real. Serenity. I need her in a helmet though. I need yeah. her in a roller derby. Derby. Oh, the last one is in a roller helmet. Derby. 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 Let me let me go oh, back go. to their. Uh, is the last one? Oh, it is. Day five. Look at this. Helmet. Uh, let's see. There she is. My school helmet. Okay. Close enough. Here's your recap. She's great. Good for you. God, I'm just thrilled to see her yeah. do so Your well. Daily recap nice hairstyle there. That's good. Three, two, one, go. That was definitely one of those hires where I... Made me so happy. Yeah. It was definitely one of those hires where not only it's, it's I do say good for Serenity, but even more strongly say, oh, good for Apple. Oh, what a great hire that is. Yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like, yeah. Does she appear on camera in any so of them or is it all Memoji? Uh, Memoji, I think. Or it's all Memoji. I haven't seen her. Recap? Yeah. Here we go. So they, that's a good one. Ready Top one. Your day three recap. Here <laughs> but we go. a former I, I'm more app editor, Ali Kazmuha, has appeared in session videos both this year and uh, last year because uh, she is the engineering program manager on Game Center now. Uh, so these recaps uh, are worth watching. They're not very long, or are they? Um, hey there. They're, they're, they're great. Two minutes, 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 minutes a minute. Apple. They're very quick. Did you miss yeah. day one at Dub Dub? Well, let's go back in time. So in a minute, you can get, you know, Good morning. The basics. And welcome to it's almost like she has advanced access to the schedule. As if she <laughs> knew ahead of time what was going to no happen. Safari these are snappy as heck, up. man. They, yeah. they put a lot of effort into these. They move, move, move. Wow. I also, I also am very curious about the. I would love to see the backstage tools that they use to create not just like the the, the emoji that we get access to with with live animation, but when they need to burn like a high quality 4K emoji for this kind of purpose, what tools do they use? Do they actually start with uh, like a a live recording that they then post process? Or there's that, I bet there's a lot of really cool tools behind the, the because they yeah. use that tool so many often so often. Sorry. Like the, the audience, Tim Cook had a whole audience of Memojis yeah. all animated at the same time that like a version of massive from, uh, from the Hobbit, but, but purpose built from Memoji. <laughs> no, I th I, th I was, I was going for minions when I first saw him walk out on stage, but the, it's, it's the same point. <laughs> they do look like minions, don't they? Yeah, but I'm all hungry. <laughs> that technology lets you have a variety of different looking things, all you doing like natural behavior instead of being like a bunch of robots. Each one is doing something different, but doing it at scale, which is always, you know, fun. Uh, June 15th of 2021, the first day that every single Apple store in the world has been open simultaneously for over 75 weeks. Mm -hmm. I think if you're going to pick one news item that says COVID is over, that's it. Wow. In the, at least in the United States, yeah. Well, this is worldwide, yeah. though. I mean... Uh, Really? Well, there's not yeah. Apple stores like in India and, and that's you know, true. Brazil some of the hotspots may not be. But the, I mean, the UK, yeah. UK extended for another month. So, really interesting graphic here showing uh, the number of Apple stores that were open. Then suddenly, as you can see with the with the this is uh, in uh, March of 2020, nothing, and then going back up and down and up and down and up and down. But uh, we're back to 511 stores uh that's good that's good oh well, i think sydney's not open because uh they're working on it or something uh let's see what else what other news um <laughs> if you were hoping to get that apple tv plus trial for a year uh it's starting next month they're going to reduce it to three months with hardware purchase I don't know if that indicates they're producing content again. That that's time to you know it's time to get it. Yeah, because we were getting uh, rebates every month. I guess that'll yeah. end. Yeah, because right. they couldn't make anything. Right, right. <laughs> the uh, free year trial was extended twice for an additional nine months free, but that's going to all expire next month. You're going to have to start paying 
for Apple TV Plus. I won't even notice because I buy Apple One, and so I won't even. It'll. <laughs> yeah, it'll the same. Like, just, and now we get all the uh, the iCloud Plus stuff too, Leo. I know. I'm like, when does that roll out? Do we know yet? Uh, I got asked for it to enable it when I put the beta on, so I don't know what level of deployment it's at. But I mean, they asked me, and I said, "Yep, yep, hide all that IP stuff." So you're <laughs> in a beta for uh, not just the operating system, but for iCloud Plus. That's interesting. Yeah, it's you're so going to get that new. Like uh, just that it's it's not not quite a VPN, not quite Tor, uh, but it is basically no. a privatizing uh, browsing experience in Safari. It doesn't do tunneling and it doesn't do geo hopping the way a VPN does. But what it does do is, uh, on your side, as you make a query, it wraps that query in encryption and sends it to an Apple owned relay, and that relay removes your IP and gives you a temporary IP that you can choose whether it's loosely geographically based. Like you could choose Bay Area, for example, so you still get relevant search results for your local area, or you could choose like USA, like if you don't want any sort of information attached. It sends that to a second relay, which is not owned by Apple, which is like cloud. Flare or a, um, another big commercial um, internet junction, and that unencrypts it and sends the request. So Apple doesn't know where you're going, and that relay doesn't know where you were, uh, and the website only gets that obfuscated um, that obfuscated uh, IP address. And you you sort of have you can't be. The whole point of this is that these profiles, you know, if Leo, if you go shopping for, I think Apple's example was, if you go shopping for a couch, uh, it takes the information from your IP, it looks up all its partner friends that it buys and sells data from, and says, oh, we sent uh, Leo a lamp, you know, the other day from that IP address, so now we know his address, and he signed up for this e newsletter, so now we know his email as well, and it puts all this together, and then you leave that place, and you go to another a website, and it shows you that that couch. And then a few days later, you get a, a pamphlet on a coupon rebate for that couch in your mailbox. And then you start looking through these profiles and it's like, oh, like this is the websites Leo goes to. These are the movies he likes. This yeah. is the furniture. He has high end taste. He's in this age demo. And they want to shut, like they, they want you to be able to give that information if you want to, but they don't want anybody assembling an entire shadow profile on, on their own. Yeah, it's about if my my take after trying to understand more about it over the past year, and certainly Renee can correct me if I'm wrong, is that conceptually this is not about anonymity. This is just about privacy. Yeah, that's whereas a good way VPN to put it. And Tor, that's whereas a good VPN way. and Tor yeah. are about total anonymity. Yeah. yeah, that's a that's a good way to put it. Did, uh, I asked you on Sunday. I don't know if you know now uh, the third party that you're getting. I've seen some people report. Uh, they were getting CloudFront as the non-Apple third party yeah. in the f exit node. It's actually cleverer than that. It's, they have a pool, um, and they, they're going to have an internal pool and an external pool eventually. I don't believe the internal pool is fully functional yet. Like, it goes to Apple, but there's like four, uh, six, I think, external relays. Uh, One of them is Cloudflare. Yeah. Um, and then you uh, you get sent a bunch of tokens that are redeemable for any of those um those uh, servers. I don't think you get to choose, but it will randomize it so that even if you do successive sessions, there's no guarantee you're even going to be coming from the same relay on those. So that's sessions. good. That means your IP address will really be pretty random. It won't. It won't be repeatable. Yeah. In other words, uh, that's yeah, and good. more multiple people will be using the same IP addresses over time. Right. So they'll just not be able to trust the data that they're getting from it at all. Right. Right. Of course, I may be getting Renee's couch offers from now on, but that's okay. <laughs> yes. Uh, one way you well, they, have, they have sessions like to their credit, they have really in-depth sessions about how app developers and web developers can work with these fr frameworks. And they're also creating a bunch of secure private frameworks that, for example, you can get sent a token saying that somebody acted on what your advertisement was outside of the ad networks. It creates a direct relationship. Oh, interesting. Uh, or like they're saying, you're going to get a hundred percent open rate for all of your newsletters from now on. And you're not going to know where they were or what device they were doing or whether they actually opened it or not. But here's the frameworks that you can use to still, you know, get the data. Think about not the data you want, but the data you really need, and, and these are the frameworks. For well, Apple decides what you really need, so that's yes. not exactly <laughs> what you really need. Uh, that's an important point on this uh, mail uh, change. Is and you described this on Sunday, and it kind of surprised me. Uh, a lot of mail clients block tracking pixels, so that there's just no information. You get an opener, closer, anything. The pixel never—it looks like it never was opened. The way Apple's doing it is very different. They are opening every single newsletter on their servers, and then sending it along to you. So you get a hundred percent open rate as opposed to a zero percent open yeah. rate. 
Well, they said that they, first of all, like they, they typically use machine learning to figure out what the tracking pixel is and it's not close to 100%. It's not always accurate and there's sometimes multiple tracking pixels, but also it breaks the, the content of the mail quite often and you see things differently well, because people are really smart about making the tracking pixel critical yeah. uh, to the email. <laughs> no, I, so this gives almost you all my newsletters email. look crappy because I have, and I yeah, recommend everybody use an email client that doesn't support HTML and images. That's just dangerous. I just turn it's images just off stupid. and it looks horrible. Yeah. Yeah. But you know what? If you do a newsletter that requires that, I'm not going to read it. Yep. Sorry. Uh, I too. Yeah. But so so Apple's going to do a little... It sounds like what Apple's trying to do is figure out which which things, which things is the tracking pixel and then open the rest of it or show you, at least show you the rest of it. Well, so they that just, your email still they looks kind of good. They all of it. Yeah. Yeah. So there's no way for them to miss the tracking pixel. But because... Well, basically, they're they're proxying the the images. So yeah. you get a copy from Apple instead of from the newsletter. So they don't need to know. And the tracking know. pixel only gets... Yeah. yeah. They don't need to know what the tracking pixel is. You're getting everything, but you're not getting it you're getting a, a proxied version of it, which yeah, is fine. The, yeah, they're breaking the request chain. Yeah, they're breaking, they're breaking, the, chain yeah, they're breaking the chain. Pixel. Very interesting. By the way, if you do want to get Apple TV Plus for free, there is still one way. It's a, uh, it's a Sudoku game called Zoshi Plus. Apparently, <laughs> despite the fact that its screenshots and app description on the App Store look like a Sudoku client, if you launch the app, it's uh, thousands of movies and TV shows you stream illegally for free, including Apple's own Apple TV Plus stuff. Uh, and I guess people are figuring it out because it's been rising up the charts. It just got pulled uh, from the App Store. Apple Apple said, whoa, hold on there, Zoshi Plus. So maybe, maybe people, you know, you might want to think about installing, uh, think twice about installing apps that do that kind of thing because if they're doing that to other companies, maybe they're doing something to you too. And with iOS 15, you can press a button saying log all app activity for seven days and then press another button saying report and you can see exactly what they're doing with all the data they're pulling off of you while you're watching. Yeah, while you're stealing. <laughs> what are they stealing from you? <laughs> it got up to, uh, it was on the App Store for three weeks, got up to 50th on the puzzle games download charts. User reviews dated as far back as June 4th discuss the pirate functionality openly according to 9 to 5 Mac. It's really good because I can watch shows that aren't on Netflix. <laughs> <laughs> what? It's a Sudoku app, though, I thought. Uh, one uh, user review says they discovered the app in a TikTok video, which has more than 2.6 million views. So the word gets out, that's for sure. Uh, and the word got out, and Apple has yanked it. So bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> that's iCloud. Nice try. Bye-bye. So it sounds like we're going to get the benefits of iCloud Plus uh, when we get uh, the new version of the operating system. Yes? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's big. That's a good way to roll it out, actually. So you slow roll. Makes a lot of sense. Um, let's see. The Beats Studio Buds are out. If you Yay. want them. Yay. Uh, Yay for Android people and non-Apple like phone users and tablet users. Uh, active noise cancellation, $149.99. will work with, yes, Android. Uh, I have heard people say that it does not... The noise cancellation ain't great. I have to say the noise cancel. It's my the pick of the week, but you want me to spoil oh, it Oh, don't spoil it. <laughs> Never mind. I didn't say anything. Edit that all out. Forget I <laughs> no, no, mentioned it. I, I can tell you now. <laughs> you. Forget I know. No, save it. Uh, let's see. I think I'm just... Uh, do you have anything to say about the watch? Because we really have done scant coverage of uh, new features in the watch. There is a rumor that the new watch will be... Thicker. Um, I guess is that it's a girl delayed. bezels? Mark says the the rumor has been delayed a year. Oh, the rumor is the delayed. <laughs> How about the watch? Yeah. Is that it's delayed? now a 2022 rumor? <laughs> <laughs> oh, so the thicker one is not going to be this year. Apple Watch Series Seven will, according to Mark, have a new design, but that's now he's saying that's next year. Yeah, and there'll be an, an, a rugged model for like you know outdoor athletes, and we're still not any closer to blood sugar because that's so hard. That's yeah. just yeah. really really hard. Yeah. They'll do like blood body temperature. Um, that's which some, someone sarcastically replied to him, going, "Isn't that called a thermometer?" That's, that's just hilarious to me. <laughs> yeah, you, you you run with one of those things jammed up your you know what? That's fine. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. There's, there, there's one there's one company that thinks that they are going to have a non invasive I think uh, spectrographic blood sugar analyzer ready next year, which means that it would be at least another year before we'd get into any 
uh, wrist wrist devices if it would be even and that uh, it remains have to, to get FDA approved for. for yeah because it oh, is, that's a, that becomes a medical device it's a, it's, it's such a double I asked lead. about There's, it go ahead sorry I asked, I asked about it a couple of years ago and the answer was like we really want it we tried doing it we bought three or four companies that promised they were only a year away from doing it it turns out yeah. no they were way more than a year away from doing it because it's really hard yeah. and we keep trying and we keep buying companies but you know it's going to take a while at this page, every time it, it turns up in research papers, it does not turn up in terms of like actual functional hardware. So I did like this Apple Watch Explorer edition. I like that idea, uh, <laughs> but that'll be next year, uh, according to yeah. the rumors, yeah. 2022. That, that, that would be that is such a great step for Apple to take and maybe long delayed one, because the number of people who have been who have posted the forums of here's what here's what happened when <laughs> here's uh, here's what happened when there, when uh, I was going rock climbing and the bezel gets all scratched up here's what happened when something got got stepped on there are a lot of people who really need this is an active lifestyle watch with support for active uh roles in your life so if there are people who would spend extra for like a g-shock version uh, of the apple watch yeah absolutely uh will there be a new watch this year then or what does that mean does it mean renee they're putting on that they think there will be new watches next year, but not this year, or it's just these new features just won't the be available. Redesign and, okay. the, and the rugged thing. I mean, it, 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 they've always done a new watch every year. And it's have just they? No, yeah. they haven't. Yeah. Have they? Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Every, was, the first year was 18 months because, you know, they introduced a new version of watch OS, but after that, every September with a new iPhone, except for last year where they did September, October, there's a new Apple watch. Okay. And I, I always liken it to some people complain that the difference isn't big enough, but like Apple has, they don't think everybody buys a new watch like we do, but not, like most people, 80, 90% of the market do not buy new devices every year. They no. keep them four to yeah. seven years depending yeah. on the device. And the analogy I use is like a bakery. When you go to a bakery, you express, expect fresh bread. And like, like if I buy on Tuesday, you buy on Thursday, we should both still get fresh bread. Um, so Apple's like, it's their responsibility, I think, to make sure that any year that you choose to buy, you get the absolute best product that will last you the absolute longest amount of time possible. So whether it's just an up updated system and package like an S7 or whatever they do this year. The screen technology gets slightly better. Battery life gets slightly better. Even incremental updates are really important to the people who are buying that year, uh, even if it's not to you who bought last year. And of course, the E3, virtual E3 has been going on, the big gaming conference. There's a lot of gaming news. There's one I thought you might be interested in, Renee Ritchie. The folks at Niantic <laughs> who do Ingress and Pokemon Go have announced... Uh, at, on the heels of their, I think, is it safe to say the Harry Potter game was kind of a failure? Uh, on I the think heels, so. I think that's fair. Yeah, they're going to do their next one is going to come out later this year. Transformers, Heavy Metal, and uh, so it'll be Transformers out in the real world. See what Bumblebee is up to. I'm gonna have to enter my so this my is birthday. Weird to me because like I think they were they were successful with Pokemon because it was a, a beloved uh, you know nostalgic IP intellectual property and it was a, it was the advent of location based gaming because Ingress was very nerdy didn't have any franchise value to drive you know attachment to it and then they tried with Harry Potter. But like, it makes no sense. Like, you can catch a million Pikachus. Like, there's a, that, that makes total sense in Pokemon. <laughs> what are you gonna do? Catch a million Hagrids? Am I gonna hunt down a million Bumblebees? It makes no in-universe contextual sense to me. Like, how ha Harry Potter ended up being the worst, most tedious aspects of Pokemon. It was. it was. The just things grinding. I don't like about the game. Yeah. And that was all you could do. Yeah. And I, I just, I fear that they're taking the wrong lessons from these games. Yeah. Uh, they say a beta test betas will be out soon. You can sign up at the website transformersheavymetal.com. Um, yeah, I mean, clearly uh, from Niantic, the value now with this platform is licensing, you know, Yeah. because uh, yeah. I imagine they're getting paid by Transformers, not vice versa, but I don't know. Who knows? Maybe not. Maybe, maybe, maybe they had to pay heavy, heavy metal for that, uh, for that title. I don't know. <laughs> uh, all right. Let's take a break. Well, there is one more story from Bloomberg. Well, where would we be without Mark Gurman? Apple has hired a former BMW executive for the Apple car product. Hmm. Nice. Yeah. Hmm. Uh, they hired Ulrich Kranz. Wait a minute. Did we do this? We've done this story. 
Did we do this story? He was the guy with the skinny keep jeans. Keep hiring. <laughs> Maybe there's somebody else. Executives. Okay. <laughs> no, he's not the skinny jeans guy. That was uh, that was from another company. No, yeah. That was a that's Porsche right. designer. Audi, or Porsche, that's BMW right. Yeah. yeah. Wow, that's interesting. Former senior executive at BMW's AG Electric Car Division. He will be, uh, I don't know what his title will be. Will he be leading? I don't know. He was a senior vice president um, at uh, BMW and then founded Canoe. You may remember Canoe had this really interesting uh, idea to kind of a, a car, a self driving vehicle you couldn't buy, but you could rent or lease. So he left Canoe and Apple snapped him up. As they are wont to do. As they are wont to do. Yep. All right, let's take a break and then your picks of the week, if you don't mind, if you've got something prepared. John, I, uh, I have a little question for you. Is this one that we read out loud, or is this one... Yes, okay. <laughs> there have been changes made. <laughs> Can I tell you something? I do not like robocalls. Am I, am I alone in all this? In fact, it's got to the point... It's testify. Got, <laughs> testify. It's got to the point where I actually often don't answer my phone anymore. Well, AT&T wants to change that. Our show today is sponsored by... AT&T Active Armor. Look, we live on our phones these days, and we are always on them, whether it's live streaming content, listening to this show, catching up with the family on weekly video calls, watching your favorite podcast. And the last thing you want to be interrupted is you're in the middle of Mac Break Weekly by somebody calling up to offer you your uh, car warranty. Hi, your warranty is about to expire. No, it's not. <laughs> No, it's not. Thankful, thankfully, AT&T is making customer security a priority, helping block those pesky calls. It's not complicated. It's AT&T Active Armor 24-7 proactive network security and fraud call blocking to help stop threats. And you know what I love about this? It's no extra charge. Compatible device and service required. I actually have it. att.com slash active armor if you want to know more. Who wants to be bugged in the middle of Mac Break Weekly? att.com slash active armor for details. Thank you. Um, I do, before we do the picks of the week, I think it would be appropriate for me just to mention a couple of self serving plugs, if you don't mind. Of uh, course. We are going on a cruise to Alaska. Andy, I've, I've had great times with you on those geek cruises. I would not be on the show if we had not met on that geek cruise and you were right. shorthanded for Mac Break. Yes. I think that's right. Actually, I remember stalking you at Macworld Expo, but that's maybe that was a separate <laughs> event. <laughs> that was you. <laughs> if you go to cruise.twit.tv, we have decided to pick up the mantle. Uh, Neil doesn't do the, the geek cruises anymore. He does uh, scientific American cruises and stuff like that. So we thought, you know, Travel Store called us and said, what about a twit cruise? And I thought and thought about it, and Lisa and I talked, and we said, yeah, you know what? Let's give it a try. So this will be our inaugural cruise. It's to Alaska. It's next year. Don't worry. It's not this year. In 2022. I just wanted to mention this to put this on your calendar. Uh, July 16 through 23, 2022. Uh, we're going to have uh, a number of events. We'll be talking to people. If enough people sign up, we can invite somebody else. Hint, hint. Uh, it starts in Seattle. It's in and out of Seattle. We will cruise the Stevens Passage. You've got to see the glaciers. They're so gorgeous. We'll go to Juneau, Glacier Bay, Icy Strait Point, Alaska, Sitka, Ketchikan. Uh, on the way home, we stop in Victoria, which is a beautiful stop. What a pretty city. And uh, that'll be fun. And then we end up in Seattle on Saturday, July 23rd. Come with us. If you want to know more, go to cruise.twit.tv. And, you know, if this goes well, uh, it could be the beginning, the start of something big. I'd like to bring back the Geek Cruises. I thought that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Really, really enjoyed doing those. Because, you know, you get a bunch of people and, I don't know, it was 50, 60, 100, something like that. Depending the different cruises had different number of people. But we would all be together. We'd eat together. We'd, uh, we'd always have uh, cocktails before dinner in the, one of the lounges. And it would just was really a fun time to get together and talk to like-minded geeks. So... Indeed. We'll, we'll see if we can bring that bring that back. Uh, and then uh, the other thing I want to mention, uh, which is kind of related, is Club Twit. We're doing what we can to 
uh, make Twit more um, uh, successful, shall I say? It was a little tough this year. And uh, sales were down quite a bit, like 50%. I think we've managed to keep the shows going. But we want to give people a chance to support us, keep the shows going, and give you some benefit, too. And that's going to be Club Twit at twit.tv slash club twit. There's three benefits. Ad-free versions of all of our shows. So if you don't want to hear the ads, although I know a lot of people do, so there's actually a section on the Club Twit Discord with the ads <laughs> for people who miss them. But you can get all your shows ad-free, audio and video. There is a Discord, which is a lot of fun. We set up a, a stage in the Discord. We're taking questions in the Discord. We're, it's a great place to, to visit, to chat. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, and uh, I'm just you're, you're um, being distracted. I'm by being distracted the really by, uh, Discord, by the great yeah. stuff in the Discord. <laughs> actually, yeah, uh, we have a we put up a stage. We do take questions in some of the shows, which is a lot of fun. So if you want, that's another benefit. Actually, it turns out to be a bigger benefit than I thought. I you know we kind of threw that in, uh, but it's a lot of fun there. And in fact, there's a, there's a conversations in the Discord about other things like comics and. Uh, anime and data science and hacking and hardware. And yes, the Twit Cruise has its own section in there. And then the final uh, piece of the puzzle, there's three different benefits, is uh, the Twit Plus feed, which includes stuff that just doesn't make it to the podcast. So often some of the best stuff happens before or after the shows. Um, uh, there's all sorts of things in there. So you get all three, seven bucks a month. That's it. There's no yearly. There's It's just month to month. Cancel any time. We didn't want to sign up people for a year and then have them say, oh, I don't like it. So just seven bucks a month. And uh, it's. Uh, I think it's worth it. I really do. I really appreciate the support. Uh, if you go to club, let's see, It's tw this one's twit.tv slash club twit. Twit.tv slash club twit. And uh, Chickenhead21 says, can we get the ads without the show? And you have <laughs> You absolutely can. <laughs> there is a whole section that's just the ads, just the ads. And then people talk about the ads. So that's good. Uh, all the ads all the time. You can, you can, you can literally listen to a version <laughs> with just the ads if you want. Actually, I think for the audible ads, that probably is a premium feature. <laughs> if you want the audible <laughs> ads, we're going to charge you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for your support. Now it's time for the picks of the week. We'll start with you, Andy and Otko. Uh, there, Amtrak has just made an offer that they haven't made in a number of years, and it's for some people it's going to be very very exciting. For some people, it's not going to be exciting at all. But I'm I'm here to speak to the first group. They're they're coming back to the they're redoing the USA Rail Pass. Oh, good! This is a pass where for three hundred dollars of uh, for three hundred dollars. Uh, you can spend 30 days making as many as 10 different stops anywhere on the Amtrak network. Uh, you for the it's normally 500 bucks if you go if you buy it before next week. I think the 20th the price is down to 300. dollars You have 120 days to make your first trip, and then after you make your first, you have 30 days to use all 10 of your segments. So that means that from any any uh, and each segment on the map consists of wherever you get off uh you wherever you get off or have to get off the the train because of a connection that consists of one segment so that could mean this is this is this is the sort of thing that like gets me kind of inspired because as soon as i thought about that i'm like oh i could do the andy and not go pan eastern seaboard goodwill mm. tour because like boston to new york that would be one new york to philadelphia would be two philadelphia to washington would be three norfolk virginia would be four i'd have to make the stop at norfolk because that's where you change that's where you have to change trains to go all the way direct to orlando so maybe I could go to disney world Ooh. so that's five and then i could make my way back up stopping at different towns like on the way up and then i then i just, uh, i was looking at the rest of the map thinking well gee you've never been to like uh georgia you've never been to like tennessee and then i thought that ooh, is there a train stop near dollywood and i'm like what if you just went from like dc to dollywood you have, you know, dollywood sounds like a nice place to be uh and of course you don't have to like do it all in like one trip if like i could also do it as like just boston to new york and go make like five different round trips to new york and for 300 bucks that would be 30 dollars per uh, per trip which would be at least half to a third to a quarter depending on how long you go but once again uh, Boston all the way to Norfolk, Virginia would be $30. That's usually like a $180 trip. Uh, so it's very, very tempting. I've done now. I'm a big fan of Amtrak, as you've heard before. Uh, my usual uh, endurance is about 
DC, about eight hours. Uh, although when I was the, the last time the, the I did take this offer once uh, years ago when I had a book out and I decided I'm going to do like an Amtrak book tour. And I decided to go from Boston all the way to Chicago, 22 hours uh, in one go. And that's that's a thing, man. That's a scene. That's you, you want to bring a pillow. You want to bring a cooler. You want to bring something to put your feet on because this is all in coach. Uh, so maybe you would need to have a certain sort of adventure to do the 20 hour segments. But a lot of these are just like three hours, four hours, five hours. And it's a chance to I mean, there's a to pick like a random stop here. I might not necessarily want to go to King Street, South Carolina, but. But again, if I'm on my way back, if I'm on, my, if I'm near, if I'm in, if I'm in D.C. anyway to see some uh, see some museums, maybe I will spend one of my segments to check out because just it's nice to go. It's nice to go to D.C. to know that hey, I really want to go to uh, the uh, federal archive, the U.S. archives because I want to. There's some things I want to research there. But also, gee, if I'm in D.C., I'm only like two hours away from this other place I've never been to, and now it only cost me like thirty bucks. You don't have to plan. And the great thing is you don't have to plan out your route in advance either. It's just simply. It's like it's like hopping the rails. It's like being a hobo. You just simply decide that okay, it's, I, I'm within my with, after after you've done your first one. Now I'm within my 30 day window. I just simply open up the Amtrak app, decide okay, get, take me from where I am now to this other place, and boom, your ticket is paid for because it's one of your 10 segments. So. I think that after the last year, a lot of us are kind of interested in this. I just want to be anywhere other than within the two mile radius of my house. I've been I was for 14 months straight. And for a lot of people, myself included, this is very, very enticing. Once again, if you get uh, I think that the uh, uh, the discount uh, is up like on. Uh, I've got the, the press release in front of me. The, the discount is up on the 20 22nd. Sorry, the 22nd. Uh, so that's next week. If you don't get it then, then it goes up to 500 bucks, which is still a pretty good deal if you're going to if you're going to use it uh, uh, thoughtfully and tactically. Uh, but yeah, that's you take I think the train kind of all the time, right? To uh, D.C., oh, yeah. New York, to. I've, I've, I, my rule is I don't fly anywhere closer than DC because, uh, especially to New York, because, uh, the thing is you, I get, I get on the train. I, I take like a, a 20 minute Uber to a local train station. I, I walk directly from the train, from the platform onto the train, no security, no, no checks. No, you have to check in an hour beforehand. It's, you get to spend three hours like on a, in a comfortable, big, trains. like business class seat yeah. with, with internet access. Cause yeah. your, your wifi hot spot works if you want to drink go to the bar car get a drink or set up at a desk at a big table inside the bar car and get work done and then when you get off the train in new york city that drops you off right in the middle of midtown and you, you feel as though your brain is there at the same time as your body whereas my god i mean it's 45 42 43 minutes to fly to new york but there's like two hours in front of that then two hours after that and all this uh all inhumane. the airport stuff i love trains yeah. um so i is it how comfortable are they these days? You said it's like a business class seat. Very no, a coach seats are they're big. They're big coach class seats. Okay. They're also very rarely now the Excellus trains, like the, the the business class and the really high speed trains. They tend to book up, yeah. but the they're enough. They put enough cars onto the coach section that rarely am I do I have the seat next to it's a they're, they're two seats by two seats. Yeah. Very rarely is the seat next to me occupied. And not only that, but there's also a power outlet like at your like a regular. Nice, like 110 volt power outlet at your seat. So it's not even a chance. It's not even a case of oh well, I can get 12 volts and maybe charge my phone. It's like no, if you can, if you can bring a microwave oven on board, and you can, if you want to bring a, hot, a make a <laughs> hot pocket and, and cook think... a meal, you could do that. <laughs> you could if you had to. The theoretically, I haven't put this in play. I'm saying that theoretically, I, I'm I'm saying that it is the nicest time. And all, the other thing about Amtrak, I'm sorry, this is going on to a rant because you hit a topic that I really I like. love Amtrak the, and I the, loved. We took the train to Sacramento. Get, yeah. It was so much fun it's great and they're, and they're, but they're and they, been so i guess hey, the cars are getting a little run down now they're they're a little old but they don't they're not scummy they're not terrible no. to, to be in um but they, but they're the other thing that i always like to mention is that there have been when i'm in new york i sometimes i i think that i've uh, i have enough uh, uh, i can on three hours of sleep that i can stay in new york until like midnight or 2 a.m and take the red eye home but i decide that at 5 p.m that no i don't want to i can't stay awake that late and so all you and so you just simply go go to the amtrak app and say are there seats available check okay there's seats available on the 745 
train home. It will, they will give you there's no there's no charge for uh, for rebooking. They will give you full credit for whatever you paid for your first ticket. But you know if the price if the if the price is higher because you're booking you know the same day, you pay the difference. But usually it's like maybe 20, 30, 40 bucks. And again, it's such a humane way to do things. You go Boston to to New York. Boston to New York. I, I, Boston to New York routinely. Also Boston to uh, DC uh, when I have. How long is the trip there. to uh, the city from uh, Boston? Uh, about three hours, three, three and a hours. half hours. Okay. They've the, the Excel is, is a lot as uh, as maybe about a half hour, forty five minutes faster. the The only the only real disadvantage is that sometimes, uh, particularly if. Uh, in New York, uh, uh, particularly if I'm going from New York back up north, uh, delays can definitely happen. Usually they're on time, but sometimes you might find yourself waiting 45 yeah. minutes to an hour. It's not like Japan. Because, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Japan, and, and also, the trains are so on time. And, and they, and they apologize lose, if, if they're a minute late. They actually yeah. make abject apologies. They come oh, out yeah. on the no. platform. So they, did, did you hear that there was a, on one of the one of the bullet trains? They, uh, the leader, the director, had to apologize yeah. because the train left twenty seconds early. Yeah, <laughs> I uh, we 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 were in uh, Tokyo. Uh, actually, I think it was uh, we took the bullet train to Tokyo from Osaka. Um, we were told now don't dilly dally. The doors will open. <laughs> you will have two minutes to get on. And that's it. So don't dilly dally. Hop on and get on and get on because they're leaving. <laughs> they keep to a schedule. So they will scold really you good. if you use your phone. All this sort of oh, stuff. Oh, it's wonderful. I love the. Tra I I would love to see us with train travel maker rec resurgence here in the states. It's just a great yeah, way to go. I, I would love. I, my dream is always it has always been to cross the country in a roommate. But that's the that's that's my cutoff point because it's like. Uh, but every time I think about doing it, it's like. Uh, but then for the amount of money I would spend on it's the expensive. extra to, for the yeah. roommate, I could fly to Los Angeles or San Francisco and have the extra money for an extra couple of nights yeah. hotel and have that the same. So, yeah, we took when I was a kid in 1971, when we moved to California, we took a roommate from Chicago to Oakland. And uh, it and, was a, it's a wonderful memory. In fact, so much so that Lisa and I uh, pretty soon, I don't know when it'll be next year, the year after we're going to do the Canadian has uh, the via rail has a luxury cross Canada a uh, train trip that I, it's also expensive. It's like a cruise, but you stop yep. in all these great places. And it's, I mean, that's, that's, that's the nice thing, especially again with this rail pass, because it goes through cities that are not like, right. they're, they're not like the top 10 tourist destinations. But the thing is for the past 150 years, they have been a major train stop. So there are things right in that neighborhood, right in that district. And so it's in the same trip. Yes, I can go to DC and see all those great museums, but I can also stop at a small town, go to a small diner, come back on the train like three hours later, uh, and then have, <laughs> some really great pictures and some experiences that I would never have been able to plan beforehand. Renee, it's if we did a, a uh, if we did a Twit Trans Canada train trip, would you come on it with us? And <laughs> I, I can't promise that I'd be on it with you because Renee doesn't do well in confined spaces for oh, long periods of time. I'm more oh. of a house animal, house pet. But uh, Via Rail is uh, amazing, and the places it stops are just so quintessentially and beautifully Canadian. Well, um, yeah. I know people who've done short segments of it, like across going from Vancouver to. Uh, Calgary through Banff, you know, there's just some amazing sites. It, it is, that's the Rocky Mountaineer. And that, that by the way, that is, yeah. it is a dream of mine to do this. Uh, and I, and we will at some point. I just can't yeah. wait. I don't you think. You can't go to Montreal on Amtrak. You cannot? You, you can. That's, you that's, can. The end, that's the end of the Amtrak service. Yeah. Line. Well, I, I used so to do go, it all the time because my sister lived in New York and went to John Jay College uh, to do her, um, not bachelor, master's degree. And so I would take that every few weeks and it was a nine hour milk run. <laughs> every time <laughs> with an abundant amount of time at customs because sir, take going through a train is it's something when you're at customs. Oh, I bet. <laughs> Papers? Papers, please. Don't don't if, don't bring your collection of furs because they'll <laughs> they'll they'll definitely flag that. They'll definitely. Put and you side. have to surrender all your use from all your words on the way to the U.S. <laughs> it's just uh, Renee Ritchie, your pick of the week. Let me see. All right. So these are the Beats uh, Studio Buds. Yeah, they and are. I don't want to say it's it's a surprise. Uh, you know, they're not really a surprise because Beats has sort of been Apple's alt account. You know, like us, some of us have an alt account for all our rock bands that we want on Instagram. We don't want, you know, to be following them along with all our friends. This is Apple's alt account where they can experiment with different form factors and different sort of technologies and branding and do Mickey Mouse licenses that the ghost of Steve Jobs would never allow on AirPods proper. <laughs> so... 
this is particularly interesting because they are $149, so cheaper than the AirPods 2, you know, like they, which, which are 159 much cheaper than the 249 AirPods Pro. And they have some of the same capabilities. Most, you know, for some people, this will be a huge advantage. There is no, absolutely no stem on them. You just have this beats button and it's a clicky. Oh, that's weird. It's not a capacitive button. It is a real clicky button. Oh. And you have different nibs. And these fit in my poor mangled jujitsu judo mangled ear is better than any headset <laughs> I have ever worn, wired or wireless. The, the right ear actually stays in. Like these AirPods, I'm keeping, I'm adjusting them all the time during the show. Um, these just stay in. I did all sorts of outside activity. I did Fitness Plus. The fit is wonderful. What you get is uh, active noise cancellation. Now, uh, some people say it's better than AirPods. Some people say it's worse, better than Sony, worse. The thing with active noise cancellation is it's not an absolute. It depends on the environment. Some are really good at continual sounds like engine buzz, not good at random sounds. Uh, the algorithms are really differently tuned by different companies. Some of them are more conservative because they don't want to block out important sounds. Some of them are more aggressive and then you might miss things that you actually want to hear in, like in your music. So that varies a lot, but also your, your own hearing uh, is it is different than everybody else's hearing. So like, when I see people say it's better or worse than that, to me, it just means like you don't understand the technology of ANC. You've got to try them. And for you, that might absolutely be true. Someone else might like them a lot better as long as we're talking about the same class of devices. So I like these a little bit better than AirPods when it comes to active noise canceling. It just seems to suit my environment a little bit better. There are some downsides. And it does the transparency mode too, which boosts uh, sounds. Yeah, that's a nice feature AirPods. on the AirPods Max. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, uh, because that way, like, they're not blocking off the sound. You don't get Apple's H1, W1 or H1 chipset. This has a custom chipset that's designed to optimize for both iOS and for Android. Nice. So it does the auto pairing the same way as AirPods on iOS. It does the Android? You tap it to the screen, and it pairs both pods separately. So in case you want to only listen with one or the other, oh, you can do that. Interesting. And it uses Android's built-in framework to do that. It works really well, but it doesn't do the automatic. Uh, propagation of that pairing to all your Apple devices. Um, and for some people, that'll be a curse because they love to set it up once and use it everywhere. For other people who think that it's just so darn promiscuous that when your AirPods Max are across the room, they're still taken over you know, from the headset you're wearing now, could be a blessing. You've got to figure that out for you. There is no capacitive charging, no capacitive charging case, but it uses USB-C instead of Lightning. So if you're if you're just an iPhone user, that might irk you because you have an abundance of of Lightning cables. But if you are a like a, a MacBook, an iPad, a Nintendo Switch, an Android user, you know, if you're a PC user, you're still on USB-A. So I, I I feel for you. But you know, for most modern technologies, you'll have USB-C cables, uh, and they have like beats sound. The way that I understand Apple's lab works is they te they move everything to scientific, like absolute, and then they have a bunch of humans tune it because scientific sound is not really good for anybody. And there's like just different humans tuning them. So you get, it's not the old beats, you know, boom, 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 bassy sound, but it, to me, it sounds a little bit different than AirPods. So they've, they've still got their own unique characteristic and they're so inexpensive that and they fit so well that if I had to choose right now, even though I like, there's also no head tracking for spatial audio because there's no sensors in it. And some people care about that. Some people don't. I, but like, like I said in my review, blaster to my head, I would choose these now because even though they're missing features, the ones that they have are the most important ones for me. I, uh, I, I, of course, I haven't used those, but I, uh, I thought the uh, noise cancellation in the uh, AirPods Pro Max, the over-the-ear headphones, was superb. That's that's a different. Yeah, that's probably best in class for me. Yeah, it's yeah. different because you, of course you're sealing off off your ear that way, uh, and it's a little harder yes. to do that with buds. But um, boy, I was that I, I I should to be fair, I I did slam them for their uh, audio quality, but they I can't wait to wear them on the airplane. It's the best noise cancellation yes. I've ever used. So. They're Bluetooth, so you're always going to be limited by what yeah. audio can be put through a Bluetooth pipe, and that's never going to be great. No, it's a little disappointing, but that's life. I was, you know, it's a shame the wired, <laughs> the $35 not included wire doesn't give you actual wired sound, but... He, but the $10 part will, like if you get Apple's $10 adapter and then plug in your own cord, uh, you'll get it. You're kidding. Wait a minute. Tell me that again. That's got a... Yeah, so Apple, since they deleted the headphone jack, Apple made this little $10... Uh, 3.5 millimeter to um, lightning adapter. And that, um, that, that's that got a DAC in it, a pretty good DAC for, for a $10 part. Oh. 
It's lightning on both ends? Because th that's the weird thing about no, the No, it's, it's the opposite of the cord that they made for oh, the okay. Max. It's a cord, like, it's, it's meant to plug lightning headphones into 3.5 millimeter jacks. Oh, that's weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so I have like lightning headphones, or so I guess, so then yeah. it will be wired headphones? Yeah, I don't know if it'll work for the AirPods Max. I haven't oh. tried that, but oh, okay. uh, you know, it, that's if, what I thought. If, you were if you do me. have lightning headphones and you want to get all this, like you, you want to get all these features, I, yeah. I can. I, maybe it will. I haven't just tested it yet. I'm gonna, or I mean, that's those are cheap. I think I'll order that. And but these are really for try. people who value convenience over quality. Yeah, I mean, that's yeah, the whole I reason understand. to go truly wireless. I'd like both, please, <laughs> if you yeah. don't mind. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> I know we won't someday. Someday we will. But uh, maybe when there's a new Bluetooth codec, there are new newer codecs than Aptex that supposedly sound better. Bluetooth five supposedly sounds better. We'll sh we shall see. Would have been nice to have that uh, headphone jack. Then I'd have a choice. <laughs> Mister Renee Ritchie, thank you so much. Renee Ritchie dot com. No, uh, YouTube dot com slash Renee Ritchie, right? Yes. What are what are you? You've you got promise. a new thing you're doing. It's the uh, new Rene Ritchie. He's changed his oh changed his tone. Yeah, well, I I, I went through a real. I, I don't want to bore everyone with the details, but I went through like in my personal life a really really hard week last week, right oh, in the middle of WWDC, and it caused me to reevaluate just how I was doing things, why I was doing things. I was going for a really. I spent a month working on like packaging my content for YouTube and what would get high retention and you know would be like. Uh, more clickable and I just I got so based uh, because I didn't sleep because dub dub and because I was going through all these issues that I just and then there was just such like I get triggered when there's reporting that I feel like is being opportunistically um, uh, what's the right word when it's taking advantage of a reader rather than trying to educate oh, them being God, exploitive yes. oh God like, yes rather than trying to like you have an opportunity when something happens and Apple doesn't explain or Google doesn't explain your choice is I can use that to clickbait and exploit my audience for those clicks or I can educate like I can do the work, the research, figure it out and explain it to you so that you, you might love it, you might hate it, but at least you're doing it smart. That's what you do. Um, and that's, that's what I really try to do, but I was, I, I don't say I was getting away from it, but I was putting, I think, too much pressure on myself to tightly package things in. So now I'm just turning on the camera. I'm not worrying about scripts. I'm not worrying about editing very much. Good. I'm just recording. Um, and I call it base Renee just because like, I feel like it, like, <laughs> I don't, I don't, my audience connection is more important to me than any imaginary uh, YouTube growth factors should be. Good job. You came to Absolutely. the right decision. <laughs> Why was, do you think my tough. shows are so crappy? Because I don't care about optimizing or engagement. I just turn on the mic and we have fun. We talk with people we like about things that you think yeah, are I important. Love that. We try to tell the truth. We try to find the actual truth if we don't know it. I think that's exactly right. Well done, Renee. Yeah, I was getting in a trap where I was like looking at some other channels that were growing really, really fast, yeah. and they were doing things like uh, they were announcing. Th they were every video was <clears throat> price and date for Apple announcing products that don't exist. Right. Or right. you know, here's Apple's Confirmed. Apple's August event leaked, which doesn't exist. Right. And they were just getting hundreds of thousands of views, and I was like, I can't compete with that. But at least I can. And I'm like, you I don't even care anymore. You shouldn't compete with it. No. You should not try to compete with it. Um, I've had to come to grips with that as well. I mean, everything. You know, uh, you see that happen all the time. It's been happening as long as I've been a broadcaster. And uh, at some point, you just have to say, you know, I have a, a higher goal in life. Good good job. And you do great stuff, so keep it up. YouTube.com. I have Richard. a special interview coming tomorrow. Just a little little ah. tease for my Google fans. I have a, a, a good interview. If I finish editing it in time, I should have a really good interview for everybody tomorrow. <laughs> it's actually, I believe, a hazard of uh, having the Apple beat. It's a very challenging beat. And there's a lot of competition, and uh, it's a it's a hazard of that beat. And so I uh, commend you for uh, for doing the right thing. That's good. Don't court Thank the you. lemmings, as punter. It's Joe why says. I stopped doing rumors. You know, seven. Yeah. It, it takes me a while. I stopped doing rumors because they were too stressful. Seven for a long years time. Ago, I, stopping, I yeah. said we'll never do rumors on these shows. But then there's so many weeks without anything but rumors. We have to. <laughs> well, I cover them, but I don't break them anymore. Exactly. Like, I don't want to be involved right, exactly. in the breaking yes. of rumors, but yes. I'll cover them to tell people if they're reasonable or not. That's what we do. I think that's what that's the right yeah. thing to do because people hear the rumors. We got to tell them whether it's worth listening to. And also, they want to make decisions on like, should they buy this computer now or should they wait? Yeah. If you give them good quality yeah. information, you know, exactly. that, that helps them make a, a, a decision that's important to them for their money. Hang in there, my friend. If you need me to come up to Montreal and buy you some smoked meat and bagels, I'll be there. If, I, <laughs> if they'll let me in. I don't know if they'll let me in. Anytime. 
Not yet, but when you're, when, by the time your train goes, it'll absolutely <laughs> We're definitely <laughs> stopping in Montreal when we do the train. That's awesome. for sure. Thank you, Renee. Andy and Akko, we should take the train to visit Andy, too. We can make a whole East Coast swing. Please. Yeah, I'd love to. <laughs> Lisa's been begging me, actually. She says, you've got to do Andy's tour of the Boston Public Library. It's amazing. <laughs> I'd be very, very happy. They, uh, oh, they, and they just reopened the Boston Public Ooh. Library for the, 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 the McKim building for, so now you can walk through all the really great spaces. Oh, nice. So, yeah. Are you I'm, good? I'm when finally are you making my... When are you going back there with GBH? When is that? When does that happen? Uh, don't know. Don't know when they're reopening the studio. Um, but I'm, I have I've I've been to Boston only once, and that was just to have dinner with some friends in Harvard Square. So I'm planning next week probably to spend my entire day just walking around and re nice. re reintroducing myself to the squirrels, reintroducing myself Aww. to all that great stuff for the BPL. I miss Boston so much. I'm used to going there once or twice a week, and I've seen the the inside of the MBTA, and that's pretty much it. Uh, last month. So. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the squirrels missed you, Andy. I can tell you. They that. they 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 missed they missed their their modeling fees in the form <laughs> in the form of uh, unsal unsalted roasted uh, uh, sunflower seeds and almonds. Yum! You give them almonds. That's class, man. Most people just you know, give uh, peanuts. That's just a legume. You Again, sometimes you sometimes if you want the best of the best in the business, you know they they book up easily, they book up quickly. They like to. I want to be like the Scuvulo, where they're just they. <laughs> what what can I add to their portfolio? They had to ask before uh, they actually book it. We so. like that in Atco. It gives us actual nuts. <laughs> uh, Andy is at GBH in Boston. I H N A T K O dot com, and of course on Natco on the Twitter. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, just another program note. Uh, we um, have had for a long time a feed called the twit bits which is youtube.com slash twit and you can watch those feeds little bits from our programs those programs will continue but we're renaming the twit bits feed to tech break because we're going to also include breaking news in there jason howell and others have said hey i want to do something when something happens i want to be able to do something that day and date so that's where they'll go uh just like uh, renee said not not polished not you know not link bait but actual information authentic uh, authentic yeah, so they're on youtube.com slash uh, twit, but also uh, twit.tv slash, what is the twitbits URL? I don't even know. Twitbits? I don't know. Just go to twit.tv. You'll see twitbits. <laughs> uh, but it'll be called Tech Break from uh, this day forth. From this day forward. Uh, thank you all for being here. We do Mac Break Weekly on, of a Tuesday morning around 11 a.m. Pacific, 2 p.m. Eastern Time, 1800 UTC. Live feeds are available and always free at twit.tv slash live audio and video. If you're watching live, you should absolutely chat live in our chat room, irc.twit.tv. Also free, no charge. Uh, irc.twit.tv. Club Twit members can also chat, of course, in the Discord server, which is uh, open uh, uh, as soon as any program begins. We put the stage up and we open the uh, chat room uh, for people to talk about that particular day's programming. Uh, let's see what else. On-demand versions of the show available at the website, twit.tv slash mbw for Mac Break Weekly. Um, or you could subscribe. Actually, there's links right there on that page to the YouTube channel, which has all the Twit or uh, Mac Break Weekly videos. Uh, there's also... Uh, Click links to various podcast clients, and there's an RSS link there as well. You could paste it in any client. Do me a favor. If you subscribe in a podcast client and they have reviews, leave us a five-star review. That would be nice. That would be nice. We would, uh, we would appreciate that. That's it for uh, Mac Break Weekly. Now I'm afraid it's time to tell you you've got to go back to work because break time is over. See you next week. You may have heard about this story, but are you familiar with the story behind the story? Well, every week on Tech News Weekly, my co-host Micah Sargent and I, Jason Howell, speak to the people who are making and breaking the biggest tech news of the week. We're talking with journalists. We're talking with industry veterans. Often, we're talking with the people who are responsible for the story. Don't miss Tech News Weekly at twit.tv.